Wow, it's so quiet. <laughs> I never get this in the office normally. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for coming. My name is Jamal Kokar, and I'm the, I'm the one that just spilled water on everybody's computer. So <laughs> I'm president of the uh, Institute of the Americas. Um, actually, if somebody could come, I d actually did spell water, so. I just don't want to get Good. Well, look, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, it's a great gathering today on a very important issue. So today's event is about borders. Um, but a very peculiar and interesting part, and a, often a subject that we don't talk about borders, and we'll lead into that. But before we talk about that, what is the one universal truth about borders? That borders are, in fact, universal. So much so that, that since the dawn of civilizations, our communities, our societies, our countries, our neighborhoods, Oftentimes, even our races and our religions are defined by borders. So they evolve over time. They may be demarcated voluntarily, involuntarily. And for better or for worse, they often identify who we are. They define our identities. In fact, even as individuals, we erect our own borders our boundaries within our workplaces, within our communities, our societies, within our families. So it's what we do with those borders. It's what we do with those borders, with each other, within our workplaces, that will define to a certain degree our health, our survival, and the ability for us, either individually or collectively, to achieve greater potential. So civilizations, let alone nation states or countries, have risen and fallen based on how they choose, choose to define and work with their borders. So are they what? Demarcation lines, control lines, pain points, that area which represents the rub or the friction between countries, societies, civilizations. Well, for many of us, that actually represents probably all of that. However, we also believe that there's another side to that, that it's a unique convergence, or can be a unique convergence of cultures, ideas, creativity, languages. And so perhaps the question is how best to strike that delicate balance between economic and security concerns, and how to harness that potential, the creative synergies that exist between individuals, between countries, between societies, between civilizations. So these are just some of the questions that prompted us to come together today. We're delighted that we have with us a great collaboration with the Aspen Institute's Latinos in Society program. And that was founded on a shared belief that this is the time when we need to come together as societies and as countries, both within where we are today in, in the United States and across borders, to think more proactively and purposefully about how best to harness the potential that exists between us. For the Institute of Americas, where this is actually a kind of an interesting expression of who we are as well. We are, by nature, a hemispheric organization, where the bulk of our activities actually takes place outside of San Diego or this region. It's in Latin America, it's in the Caribbean, it's in Central America, it's in South America generally. And we hold some activities here as well. 
And our job is to try to pull together or convene dialogues and conversations between public policy leaders, private sector leaders, communities, academics, and others to harness some of that creativity and potential that exists in various countries towards addressing some of the pressing global challenges that face our hemisphere. So traditionally, we've been known for our work on energy and sustainability, led by Jeremy Martin, whom many of you know. And in the last year, we've undertaken a more purposeful, focused engagement on how best to leverage and bring into the conversation the importance and the power of innovation and entrepreneurship, led by uh, Carlos Martinez Vela, who's our vice president for that, for that area. So between that, we believe that these conversations are important bridges towards driving forward to achieve sustainable economic prosperity for all through the hemisphere. So as, as such, we're actually dedicated to, to work with the forces of the many organizations that exist here in, uh, in the San Diego region um, towards addressing the issues that are locally important because we consider ourselves part of this neighborhood as well despite the fact that most of our work is outside of here. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our um, event advisors, uh, Ruben Barrales, I think is here somewhere, Cat the Catalina Valencia, over there, and Bob Morris. Um, I'd also like to, to greet many of our friends here. I won't go over all the list of names because there's just too many to, to, uh, to go over. We'll be del we're delighted to have um, uh, Ambassador Marcela Celorio, who is the Mexican Consul General uh, to San Diego, join us later this morning. She'll be leading one of the panels, rather moderating one of the panels. I don't want to give her more work than she already has. <laughs> We're also very delighted and honored to welcome our colleagues from the Aspen Institute's uh, Latin Society program. Monica Lozano, the chairman, thank you very much for being with us today. Abigail uh, Golden Vasquez, who's the vice president and executive director of the Latin Society program. Abigail. Thank you for your hard work. And of course, your collective staff with you, uh, Haley, Lewis, and Maria. I know they're, they're here probably busily working in the, in the past. And of course, I'd be remiss in not thanking and acknowledging my own team, um, Carlos Martinez, um, who's the vice president for the Innovation Entrepreneurship Program here, and supported by uh, a very large team, Sherry White, uh, Jacqueline, uh, Yvette. So um, thank you all very much for that. I look forward to today's conversation. I have the pleasure of now just sitting back and learning and conversing with the rest of you and let these guys do all the work. And with that, Abigail. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kokar, for the warm welcome and the kind introduction. And thanks for the partnership that's making all of this possible. It's been a privilege to collaborate with the Institute of the Americas, an institution that's so aligned with our mission and our values, in particular, to work so closely with Carlos Martinez Vela and his team to develop today's innovation and culture at the border program. And I'm so excited to finally be here with all of you today. As so many of you on the border already know firsthand, the future of Latinos and the future of the United States are irrevocably intertwined. US-born Latinos are driving growth throughout the country as the aging baby boomer population declines. The phenomenon will continue into the foreseeable future with US Latinos expected to reach a third of the population by 2060. <laughs> San Diego has already surpassed that number, as have most border communities. Given these trends, not just on the border, but throughout the entire country, it's no exaggeration to say that the future of the United States rests on Hispanic Americans. The Aspen Institute founded the Latinos in Society program in 2015, recognizing that this seismic shift was taking place largely under the radar and that it required focused attention and collaboration at the highest levels among thought leaders, opinion shapers, and policymakers across sector, ideology, origin, and ethnicity. Known for its nonpartisan approach to convening at the forefront of cutting edge ideas, encouraging thought into action, 
and developing the next generation of leaders to address the critical challenges of our times, the Institute was the perfect place for such an initiative. In this tradition, the Aspen Institute Latinos in Society program provides a nonpartisan forum for conversation, learning, and idea generation on critical issues impacting Latinos and the nation. We do this by focusing on three key policy areas, economic advancement, civic participation, educational achievement, the core ingredients of the American dream. Today's program on innovation and creative economies at the border is a part of a larger ongoing effort to advance Latino economic success, which includes helping Latino businesses to scale, increasing Latino savings and retirement, and thinking and rethinking the skills and jobs of the future. Before I continue further, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the supporters of the Latinos in Society program who've helped to make today possible and all of our work possible. The Ricardo Salinas Foundation, Target, the Woody and Gail Hunt Family Foundation, the Bank of America Charitable Foundation, Comcast NBC Universal Telemundo, Edison International, the Toyota Motor Company of North America, and the Weingart Foundation. So thank you very much. At the start of our program, we chose to focus on the border regions precisely because of the missed opportunities to understand what they offer and what we can learn from them as harbingers of where the country is headed. Well, actually, where both of our countries are headed. We brought journalists, influencers, to experience firsthand the binational, bicultural, bilingual dynamism of the border, starting with El Paso, Texas, Juarez, Mexico, and Las Cruces, the area known as the Borderplex. What we found there were three deeply interconnected, interdependent economies and cultures enriching each other across generations, creating a whole that together is stronger than the sum of its parts. San Diego and Tijuana and the whole Calibaja region are at the forefront of this phenomenon on the West Coast, leading in the biotechnology, medical equipment, and aerospace industries, as well as culinary reinvention, innovation, fashion, and the arts. These are all enhanced by the melding of ideas and talent on both sides of the border. They continually build upon each other and enrich each other, feeding into a creative and transformational dynamism that defies black and white definitions of nation and identity. What's taking place here offers a glimpse into the future despite efforts to divide or turn back time. Today is about exploring how this dynamic is playing out here in the Calibaja region and in other border communities. It's about lifting up the innovation, culture, and opportunity that border regions uniquely provide. You will hear from entrepreneurial and creative individuals at the forefront of the innovation and cultural economies and who embody in their work and passions everything I've been speaking about this morning. They will share their stories, the opportunities they see, and their thoughts on how more Hispanic Americans might share in the benefits of border economies and the cultures they create. As you go through today's program and hear from our expert panelists, I also ask you to consider how we all might take better advantage of the Latino talent and assets that we have right here under our noses. We hope that you will come away with fresh perspectives on the border's distinctive potential and maybe even some new ideas or actions that you could take to advance opportunity for people on both sides. You needn't be Latino to see the value in that. So without further ado, I invite Carlos Martinez Vela to the podium to frame the discussion and introduce our first panel. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yep. Should I turn this off? Should I turn it off? No. Button? Okay. Just looking at the water here. Everything is good. <clears throat> uh, uh, welcome, everybody. It is really a, a great privilege and a pleasure to welcome you all to Innovation and Culture at the Border. Um, we've been uh, uh, working on this event for a while, so it is great to see such a great turnout here today. Uh, so many friends uh, today, it, uh, it is really wonderful to see so many new faces, but also some faces that in my year here in San Diego have become friends. And certainly it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to welcome 
our colleagues from the Aspen Institute uh, Latinos and Society program with whom we have had such a great and spirited collaboration. And I think that's going to show uh, today. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank our, uh, not only our advisors of the event, who Jamal already mentioned, but also our uh, event supporters, uh, Qualcomm, uh, the Smart Border Coalition, uh, Gustavo de la Fuente, and the Torrey Pines Lodge. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your support. Um, I want to tell you first a little bit a uh, story about how this came to be, how this event came to be. And I think you're going to see that there is an intersection between uh, that unites this event and uh, also the experiences that uh, Abigail, Monica, and the team at uh, the Latino Society program have had. Um, you know, uh, last uh, September, almost a month ago, we had a conference in Boston called Innovation and the Siri, and there, and there I met uh, Jennifer Bradley, who's the director of the Center for Urban Innovation at the Aspen Institute in Washington. And she said, you know what, I have to introduce you to my friend and colleague Abigail, uh, because you know, it was a panel around borders, and so she said, you have to meet Abigail and, and the team. Uh, and then before Abigail and I connected, uh, our friend and colleague Jaime Guzman, who's here, advisor, senior advisor to the Institute, invited me to join a meeting in LA, where Monica Lozano was a speaker. And there we spoke briefly and said, well, you know, we've been thinking about doing something in San Diego, so why don't we come together and do something? That was in October, mid-October of last year. But the, the point of intersection here is um, what we have in common and what, for me personally, really awakened a deep interest and I would say passion of what is happening in the border and the phenomenon of the border is uh, El Paso Juarez. Uh, in the same way that Abigail uh, and uh, the team went to El Paso Juarez uh, two, three years ago, I believe. Uh, two years ago, uh, I was still living in Boston. I've been here only for a year. I met uh, Ricardo Mora in the Venture Cafe in, in Boston, this uh, weekly event at the Cambridge Innovation Center. And um, you know, we talked. I was very impressed by what he by what he, uh, who he was doing. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a text message while I was visiting my family in Monterrey saying, hey, why don't you come to Juarez? We have, uh, we have a workshop. So I went to Juarez, and it was just captivating. It was captivating to see not only the border, but to see how there is this gra grassroots movement going on to change the economy and the economic development trajectory of that region. And I can only say that that is happening here also in San Diego, Tijuana, after a year being here that change is happening, and not so much from the top down, of course, all of these initiatives are great, but it's really happening from the bottom up. And, and that is uh, truly, truly inspiring. So I certainly blame Ricardo Mora for, uh, for at least one of the seeds that got us together, together here today and uh, uh, in, in this event. And uh, in that, we also share a goal, uh, which is to create a new narrative about the US-Mexico border. Uh, we know what the dominant narrative is, crime, drugs, disorder, migration. Most recently, the very infamous wall. Uh, we're gonna have the beautiful prototypes built here in San Diego County very soon. Um, I'm sure great art is going to be put on them also. Um, um, and most recently, of course, uh, the anxiety about NAFTA, uh, which has really dominated the conversation of what is happening at the border. But if we really dare to go through the smoke stream, this smoke stream, smoke screen of uh, the negativity and the traditional discourse about the economies here in the border, we see so much more. We see creativity, we see entrepreneurial energy, we see great humanity, great passion, uh, great distress, and so much unrealized potential. And uh, being here in San Diego, Tijuana, just confirms to having first been in, in Juarez El Paso that this is true. Uh, the other goal that we have is to, and that we share, is to build a more inclusive innovation economy. Having spent 20 years in Boston, I witnessed from within how innovation and inequality can go hand in hand. Uh, I can assure you that uh, innovation and entrepreneurship are not really a silver bullet. Uh, they are great things, great instruments that we have at our disposal, uh, no doubt, worthy goals to pursue, and certainly tools uh, in, in our quest to improve the human condition. Uh, but they are not una receta magica. <laughs> they are not a, a magical cure that will suddenly build a more just and thereby more peaceful society. In this respect, the question is, 
who has access to the opportunity that are being created by the innovation economy? To the capital, the networks, to the jobs uh, that are here in San Diego and in so many other parts of the country. It is a fact that women and minorities are profoundly underrepresented in the innovation economy everywhere from Austin to Los Angeles to Silicon Valley to Seattle to Boston and certainly here in San Diego. Uh, and that's the other uh, uh, goal that brings us together. And when we put all of these things together, these two goals here in the border, we have such a great opportunity. And there is such a great conversation to be had about all of this unrealized potential of the border, of the populations uh, that are here. In order to do that, uh, we need to do one thing, and I would like to offer a suggestion, which, which is we need to rethink what the border economies are about. You know, the border, uh, Ambassador Kokar already told us uh, the, the universality of borders and how can they can be um, uh, thought in many ways, can define who we are, our friendships, our economies. Um, they can also be thought as a sign. Uh, I was amazed when I first came to San Diego that driving south on the five, there is not a single sign that says Mexico. Uh, it says international border. Um, so you can deny that there is a Mexico a little bit there. Of course, many of those who are here fully embrace the fact that this is a border town, certainly not the majority. It can be a wall with signs about businesses. You know, that is the wall in, in Tecate. It's a very fecal wall, and that's across from uh, a store called uh, El Buen Queso de Tecate, from the best queso de Oaxaca and queso menonita de Chihuahua there three weeks ago. I was really thrilled about that. And you know, there is the wall right here uh, in San Diego County. Uh, that's from Friendship Park, in, uh, right where the ocean meets the wall and meets, uh, meets Mexico. We're very familiar with this uh, picture of crossing into San Diego from uh, Tijuana. That's uh, another view of the border. That's uh, crossing the bridge in El Paso Juarez, uh, I think between Chihuahuita in El Paso and Avenida Juarez. But uh, what we have here in the border too, undoubtedly, are cities. This is a visualization of the cities and the metropolitan regions, the binational metropolitan regions in the US-Mexico border. If we get closer, we see how this border is actually real. That is Playa de Tijuana, and you can see a line on the bottom of that urban area. And if your, your sight is good enough, you can even see the little wall going into the, into the ocean. From the Centro Club de Empresarios de Tijuana, you can also see San Isidro and this uh, massive uh, uh, traffic. I heard uh, recently from data, I think from, by uh, Ken Morris, I believe, here in San Diego, that there are about 50 million border crossings uh, in this border um, every year. But these are real cities, and uh, if you look at them uh, close enough, uh, in some places they look you cannot even see the border. That's uh, El Paso and Juarez. So this, you can, where is the border there? You can barely see it, right? You know, this is one of the neighborhoods in El Paso, the nice neighborhoods. Uh, the X on the other side is telling you that Mexico is, is there. So that's uh, the other side of the border. Uh, this is a view of the Tijuana River Estuary from Friendship Park in Playa de Tijuana. Uh, that's uh, the beautiful beach on the other side. Empty, uh, if we look on the other side, it is so full of life. I, it's my, one of my favorite places here, if you, you, should, you should go there. Um, and, but it is very real, you know. Uh, this is a sign also in El Paso Juarez, and you can find these signs in almost every border crossing that we have, whether it's in the Cross Border Express or in uh, uh, a concrete block in Tijuana Tecate and other places. And these are very human too. Uh, you know, the pink uh, shirt are the, the uniform of the, of the deported mothers of the dreamers. Um, so whose children uh, are in the United States, at least for a few more months. Uh, the, the guy with the back is a veteran, as many uh, 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 immigrants who have fought wars for the United States, and a few of them have been also deported. He was, by the way, subject of a pardon, of a pardon by um, Govern, uh, Governor Brown. And there are places of division. This is, again, from the US side. Uh, the, uh, the mother of this family is on the other side 
of the, of the mesh. And this is the family on this side. So there is a lot going on here. There is a great pain, great tragedy, but there's also a lot of hope. I would never think, but I think if I ever get married, I might get married there uh, by the wall. And there is a wedding there. You can, you can barely see it. And this kind of spirit is really everywhere where we look in our border cities on both sides of the border. Uh, this uh, is Tijuana. You know, this is the kind of spirit, of creative spirit, and embracing what these, uh, the communities and the cultures uh, that are here uh, mean. Uh, last uh, Sunday with my colleague Jackie, we were at uh, Mariscos El Pulpo in Barrio Logan, and I told Liz, you have, I have to take a picture of you. Uh, not only because you're beautiful, but because you have cantinflas as a tattoo, right? It's, uh, it, so it is this magical blend of things that is happening here that creates so much opportunity. We see all these and still we find a very limited border conversation, which is all about optimizing flows. It is about optimizing flows of people, capital and goods, as fast as possible and as securely as possible. That's the big concern that tends to dominate the conversation. And of course, today there is another concern, which is on the Mexican side, it's NAFTA. Uh, that's uh, uh, Flextronic, Flextronics Maquiladora. And this has driven the economic development strategy in Mexico's border cities for decades. And the strategy very often continues to be, let's bring in more boxes. Um, you know, these big boxes which are making things inside. Uh, today, this is called NAFTA. It is uh, you know, also about foreign direct investment and trade, maquiladoras, manufacturing, where the advantage uh, are low wages. And this is really a strategy of growth from the outside. And you can see this physically on the ground in these lands. You, well, you see all of those boxes here on both sides of the Tijuana-San Diego border, and you would see the same picture in Juarez. And we know how successful this economic development model has been. It has been undoubtedly very successful, but it has also had many dire consequences uh, that we see also every day uh, in, across the border. You know, these are the, the little bird, bird, birdcage homes here in Tijuana. These are abandoned homes for workers in Juarez, uh, close to the maquiladoras, and there are entire neighborhoods like that. And these houses, by the way, are tiny. Uh, um, so it would be, you would think twice about living there. I think we would think twice, but many others have no choice. So amidst all of these, we really need a new conversation, and that's what we're here to do today. And the new conversation is about unleashing the creative and economic potential of the US-Mexico border. And this is a strategy that uh, we should call growth from within. How do we mobilize ourselves here in our regions in order to create a new economic dynamic that is not just about bringing in money and more boxes, at least in Mexico, that is not just about optimizing flows, but that is about creating things, an economic dynamic from within. And it's already, the beautiful thing is that it's already happening. It's, uh, it's happening in Tijuana. You know, that was the opening of Tijuana Innovadora. Jose Galicot is here with us. Thank you for being here. And uh, Claudia, I think, is here, and Laura. Uh, there is the Frontera founders right here in Tijuana, San Diego, too. Uh, Guillermo Mejia, who's a panelist in our first panel, is one of the leaders of this. There is this incredible dynamism happening at the Technology Hub in Juarez and in many other corners and co-working spaces and places on both sides of the border that are making a difference. So in short, uh, that's a picture that a friend of mine took in Los Angeles uh, three days ago in an art exhibit about the border. The US-Mexico border is a place, imagination, and possibility. And that's what brings us together here today. There is this great imagination everywhere. That's the technology hub in Juarez. There is a beautiful mural there that speaks about looking to the future and, cha and, li and liberating from, uh, the, uh, from the border, from the maquiladora. It's happening here in Tijuana uh, in many, many ways. You know, Innova Moda, this great design culture. Uh, that's Border X Brewing uh, here in Barrio Logan, our panelist in the second panel here. 
And amidst all this, uh, just to finalize, there is one question that we're dealing here today. There is this wonderful racial dot map of the United States. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, created by the University of Virginia. You can see it every single part of this country. That's San Diego. And uh, you can see the, the orange dots are uh, the Hispanic uh, population, which is massive. But if we look at where the innovation economy is concentrated, it's up there. Um, so we have a challenge here and a tremendous opportunity. And that's why uh, I would like to think of the US-Mexico border as the land of the pioneers of the 21st century. And we are very lucky today to have here today uh, quite a few of them with us. Um, in the second panel at 11 a.m., uh, we will have uh, Jim Brown, uh, David Favela, Jesse Celayandia. They will introduce themselves during the panel, uh, but they bring together this wonderful example of how art and culture create opportunity, being uh, moderated by Marcela Celorio. And in our coming panel, and I invite everybody to come here, uh, uh, Regina, uh, Guillermo, and Ricardo, um, uh, we're going to talk about innovating at the border and reflect on how to build an inclusive innovation economy. And with that, I invite uh, Regina Bernal, uh, Guillermo, and Ricardo to sit here with us today. switch places okay it's because the mics are in order so we now we have we have to Perfect. be everything has to be under control <laughs> um, well uh, gracias Regina este, Guillermo y Ricardo por estar aquí con nosotros eh, el día de hoy uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to have you to have you here and to have you share this conversation with us and your experiences and uh, you know we don't have we we, we have enough time to have a great conversation. Uh, but so I would like to first to ask uh, just a very simple question from each of you, which is, tell us who you are, uh, tell us about your life experience growing up, and how that is reflected today in your work, in what you do in these border regions. So my name is Regina Bernal, and I manage our entrepreneurship program at the University of San Diego. I'm originally from Mexico City, and I moved here with my family when I was six years old. So I am a child <laughs> of this border. I have gone back and forth with fluidity. My family is all still in Mexico. I'm still here in the US. Uh, and I found my passion. My passion is to really support entrepreneurs. I love creativity, and I really do believe that we live in the most unique place in the world, um, in one of the most dynamic borders. And I love seeing what we're creating, I think, there's a lot to learn with this 21st century of the border, and we're recreating what this border looks like. So for me, it's very exciting to be part of that conversation and to really think about what is the future of the border in the innovation economy. Hi, good morning. My name is Guillermo Mejia. I'm, uh, actually, I was born in Mexico City, but lived in Tijuana since I was two years old. I'm a, uh, I have a BA in graphic design, but I, since 94, I've been working in, in tech with websites and moving to more elaborate projects. Right now, I work with MindHub, which is a tech incubator. We'll help, uh, help startups um, launch their MVP, either get their first customers or actually grow. We've launched in four years around 24 startups. Uh, 12 of them are active in some ways. Um, we have both entrepreneurs on San Diego and Tijuana, working either for the Latin American marketplace or for the U.S. marketplace. Um, in a personal note, I mean, I've lived in the border uh, all my life. We cons I mean, I consider myself a local Californian, even though I'm not a uh, U.S. citizen. I spend my youth going to concerts, going to colleges, working for U.S.-based companies. So it's like, uh, I feel this is my neighborhood, right? Um, and with that, uh, trying to figure out our space and, and what does uh, resources in San Diego and Tijuana offer entrepreneurs, we uh, launched this initiative called Frontera Founders, which where slogan is, we don't see a border, we see a new frontier. 
So we believe that uh, entirely, that there's a new frontier just uh, leveraging both the binational community. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Ricardo Mora, and uh, I was born in El Paso, Texas, raised in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, spent most of my life in Juarez, went to U.S. schools. And uh, my background is that I've, I got involved in business uh, in the cellular industry and in the food industry. Uh, and today our passion is really moving the needle on helping entrepreneurs, on helping local businesses, and on helping industry. So we're, we're uh, spearheading a model called Technology Hub in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, we're uh, helping people come together. Uh, we, we call this Connecting Minds and uh, bringing the community together in a space to collaborate. Currently, we have over 40 companies in our ecosystem. Uh, we have a venture fund uh, that we help these companies develop. We have a fabrication lab within the space. And we're super excited about what's happening in the region. I mean, we get companies crossing over from El Paso to Juarez, and then we have companies coming from Juarez wanting to go over to El Paso. So that's a little bit about what we do. And uh, I have a six-year-old daughter and a beautiful wife. And uh, I like general aviation. <laughs> I heard that recently. Yeah. He's a pilot too. So, um, so there is this common thread in the things you, you all said, and this is almost as if the border didn't exist for you. I mean, it is there, but it is not there. And actually, that reminds me of something that Norma Iglesias Prieto from San Diego State University says, which is that there are different ways to look at the border. It's like, you know, there is no border, there sort of is a border, or there is. There is no border because we deny it exists, or there is no border because we just move across it as if it didn't exist. What do you think has enabled you throughout your careers, when you look at your education, your background, your upbringing, mm -hmm. to move and to think of these regions as a unit? And when you look at the entrepreneurs and the people you work with, what is it about them? Who are those who are able to do mm -hmm. this movement across the board? I think I know what you're hinting at. <laughs> um, so for me, the, the border is very much there. <laughs> so um, I came when I was very young. But for me, my outlet, outlet was education. So I was very fortunate to go to school in the US. So in a way, my fluidity of the border came through my educational experience. But it was there. I mean, for my, my father owned radio stations, so in a way, he, the way he saw the border was with air and ideas coming back and forth. But for me, I, I did see the border, but I was very focused on my education, and I really valued um, the opportunity to be here and go back and forth as a student. So I think for me, that was transformative in my understanding of the border and the openness I had in coming back and forth through education and being part of a university that allowed that? Um, well, mostly is, uh, Tijuana is so isolated than the, uh, from the rest of Mexico. <laughs> Just to give you a sense, so from Mexico City to Dallas, it is closer than San Diego to Dallas. So uh, we're so far away from Mexico City. Uh, and if you look around, I mean, the only place that we can grow your business or just uh, get out of town is San Diego, LA. I mean, LA is about the same distance than Mexicali, which is the nearest uh, major city in, in Tijuana. Uh, other ref uh, references, downtown San Diego is closer to Tijuana than Carlsbad. So, I mean, that, that's just the natural evolution. I mean, we're so close. Uh, where are we going to do our shopping, our, our, our living, expanding, just driving and, and getting out of town? It's going to be in San Diego. So that actually encourages us to be more of explorer and look at California as our first uh, logical neighbor. So even there is a border. I mean, we just, that's, that's the only neighbor we have next door. I mean, we cannot think about Guadalajara, Mexico, or Monterrey. They're so far away, so uh, and inaccessible. We just think about San Diego and, and then like, and when business uh, uh, think about expanding, I mean, in the tech sector, 80% of small business, I'm talking about 10 people, 20 people, 80% of them export their services. That means they sell to US companies. That's, I mean, small businesses in Tijuana export their services. That's a huge thing. And that's just the natural, uh, 
the nature of our ge uh, geography. Well, in, uh, in my case, I, I definitely don't view the border as uh, something that separates us. I've always seen it as just going across, even when we were kids, uh, going across the downtown El Paso and shopping downtown El Paso. And uh, so, so the border, uh, from my perspective, is non-existent. Um, I've been privileged to be able to cross over uh, back and forth. Uh, not many have that privilege. And, uh, and you know, today we have those express passes and, and, and we can get back and forth. There's times that I go three or four times in a day. I'll have meetings on both sides of the border. You know, we're, we have that advantage. So what we try and do is, is uh, as a community, get this out to the rest of our, of our entrepreneurs, our business leaders, to help everybody understand that, that if we work together as a border town, it can make us all stronger. So from my perspective, it's, it's just been, and I'll share a small uh, story. I, uh, my first business venture was a hot dog stand down at the Juarez uh, Avenue. And I used to cross over to El Paso every Wednesday to Sunbeam to buy the, you know, the footlongs mm -hmm. and, uh, and then cross them over to Juarez. So, uh, you know, that's just how business gets done. And that's a real example of, of how we got started. Good. So uh, I think when we were preparing for this panel, uh, you brought up um, uh, Regina, the issue of mobility. Mm -hmm. across the border, and, and you describe it, Ricardo, as a privilege. Right? What uh, it enables uh, us here, because we're all privileged, to have that privilege uh, versus those who do not have that privilege, to move across the border, to do business, and to buy, and to shop, and to find capital to create a business. You know, and there might, there might be very basic things, like, mm -hmm like uh, having a passport, like having a, a sentry card, like um, having friends, like speaking the language, mm -hmm. uh, both. So can you just reflect a little bit on this issue? So I think speaking the language is a big part of it, but also <coughs> social networks. So I think that's a huge privilege that we sometimes <coughs> underestimate. Um, we talk about the influence of mentors in our lives, and for me that has been trans transformative. So mm -hmm. I think I've been able to grow because I have had people along the way to support me and to bring me into different circles and to help mentor me and you know, have important conversations. So to me, that social network of people has been the greatest wealth in my life in, in, in that development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me use another example from my childhood. So a lot of uh, broadcasters in San Diego establish um, TV and radio stations in Tijuana and the Mexican stations. And it's odd because when I was a child, I only had one station in Spanish and six in English. So there's a full generation of people who grew up watching American TV in, in the border, across the border. Um, and that's how we learn English, oddly enough. It wasn't to school, it wasn't to education, it was watching TV uh, cartoons and TV shows and that pop culture. Uh, so mobility is more than just about uh, how close it's, it's about uh, cultural identity, about who we are, about life experiences. So uh, it's, again, if you go to San Diego, you'll see, or LA, you'll see a lot of people sharing common experiences with you because they, grew up with uh, experiencing the same things you are. And it's sometimes it's different uh, from the rest of Mexico. And even Mexico has like three areas. Uh, Mexico City and, and, and Guadalajara has a similar experience, but the South, uh, more rural experience are so far removed from our Northern life experiences. So it's only natural that we gravitate to those type of, uh, 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 we look for aspirations in jobs, in doing businesses that are a match with us, and we buy products, and we want to live uh, with something we identify. So we're not going to go back and look to Mexico City or Guadalajara because they're not within our, our, our own personal lives. Well, um, you know, I'll add, and, and I think mentorship is very important. We've all had our mentors, and we've all had people that helped us along the way. Um, that's part of our business model, paying it forward. And uh, in, in our case, in the work that we do in Juarez for innovation on entrepreneurship, we have several companies that showcase this cross-border, you know, going back and forth and understanding how they're getting enabled to do this. 
And an example is a company called uh, Negawatt. They're a US-based company, started in, a, in an incubator in El Paso, uh, led by, uh, by a retired, uh, uh, you know, served in the military. And uh, he has his office in Tech Hub in Ciudad Juarez. And he's helping the industry on their, on their, uh, uh, their energy sector. So that's a company that sees it naturally. Uh, you know, he served in the military. And now, he, you know, he's, every day he's in Ciudad Juarez helping industry. We have another company from Ciudad Juarez that's called Traceability. And this company is, uh, is being enabled to go to the US and they do automation. In this case, they're, they're working with the Internet of Things uh, and they have a program that, that allows uh, companies to be able to track their employees as they come into the workforce to have a, a faster start. So, so for us, we see this, this happening. This, these are the innovation uh, uh, themes that are happening across the border and we're excited to share that and, uh, and you know, they get enabled by having a platform. They get enabled by having mentors and, uh, and being able to work in this, in this regional ecosystem. There is a, another common theme in, in the three of you, which is this creation of these spaces. In, in the case of, uh, of Guillermo and, and, and uh, Ricardo, actual physical spaces that become these meeting points, these convergence points, uh, I think, uh, uh, Jamal, you use the word convergence. Um, so it's almost as if within these border towns you have places where you know, it's free to come together. In your case, Regina, the, the, the binational mm -hmm. venture competitions that, you, that you've done. Mm -hmm. Can you reflect a little bit on this issue of the creation of these spaces and why do they matter? Why do they matter in order to enable to do business here at the border? But why do they matter also to include uh, people that might not normally be included in these conversations? Mm -hmm. I think that it doesn't have to be a physical space. I think we're fortunate that there's a lot of openness in San Diego to help create the space, even if it's not our own. So uh, for the University of San Diego, what we've done with our pitch competition, we love including students from across the border, not just from across the border. We have all different nationalities. And what you see is the tackling of creative problems with a lot of different solutions. And there is wealth to that. If you're always listening to the same views, then you're always creating the same thing over and over again. But when you're able to bring diversity into the conversation, then you start to listen to different things. And it's not the easiest. And I think sometimes we miss the point. For example, we had a boot camp that we did with Guillermo, and we invited some students from across the border. And for us, we just said, come. But maybe we hadn't thought about public transportation or we hadn't thought about how they would arrive. So for me and for us, it was a learning curve of saying, if you want to create these opportunities, we also have to think about um, what this looks like and how we can facilitate those connections as well. That's when the border turns very real, right? When, right. <laughs> where, when you don't have public transportation, when you are waiting for two hours in line. And, and that becomes a real obstacle there. I mean, what about you, uh, Guillermo, in this? So, yeah, so we have a 4,000 square foot building. We have 150 developers in-house, and, and the incubator is one, just one part of that space of, 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 the, of the mine hub. Uh, we share those resources. But one of the things is actually um, having, breaking this thing that, uh, that oh, the, the U.S. and Mexico are like something different, right? So one of the goals is to actually achieve uh, that sameness, that we can actually compete with U.S. companies, that we actually want to, we could be at that level and offer that quality, that type of service. Uh, so one of the reasons why we participate in the B, uh, B2Pitch is that we want our startups to compete with U.S. startups. We want them to be as good as them, and we want them to beat them. Uh, yeah, we want to be the, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, but that, that's a learning curve and actually training them. So, and facing those added challenges, because let's face it, the border is always going to be, the crossing is going to be always a challenge. Uh, being Mexican Latino has always been a challenge. Having to learn and to pitch in English has always been a challenge. We need to overcome that, those challenges, no matter uh, what happens. We need to actually get those entrepreneurs to face what's going to happen. Uh, raising capital, uh, it's going to be a challenge for uh, Latino startups. So let's go, ahead, let's go ahead and let's face it. So one of the ideas within that uh, is we understand where we need to be 
we're trying to find those spaces that allow us and actually help us achieve those, those goals. At the end of the day, once we get to that place, we'll see the results. But that's why the, the, the physical space is so important. Mm -hmm. It's a space where you, we actually push them, but you have a, 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 a home that you feel secure. You have a, a team that actually not only mentors you, but actually understands your, uh, what you're facing. On the other side, if you're a, a US-based entrepreneur, or let's say an Argentinian or a Brazilian startup, and you want to expand either to Latin America or you want to expand to the US, that's like a soft landing. That space, we understand the culture. We face it every day. So uh, just going on and crossing every day and trying to knock doors and getting customers and understanding how to market to uh, a consumer in the US, well, we, we have that space that offers those expertise. And we have the resources that we can um, help you grow in that regards. Perhaps before we go to Ricardo, just to follow up on what you just said, uh, you mentioned about this entrepreneur from Chicago that, is, uh, uh, that before coming to Tijuana had not discovered that there were a lot of business opportunities in Latin America. Uh, so talk about that a little bit, but let's talk about, you know, we have here, we saw the, the dot map of San Diego, Tijuana, this massive population who would be ideally bilingual, bicultural, many of them not binational, right? What do you think of this idea of this population here, many entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who have small businesses, having access to the Latin American market. And what do you think of that market as an opportunity for them? Well, overall, the Latin American market is huge. It's like 300 million people. And it's underserved, greatly underserved. Uh, just to give an example, so you probably know Intuit or like uh, Quick Tax or TurboTax. It's been in America for like since the 80s, right? So we launched the first type of uh, uh, system for Latin America. In that regards, it's really been underserved for the last 40 years. So if you want to go and really take that low-hanging fruit, Latin America is a great starting place. Uh, again, the U.S. competitive space is so crowded, uh, people are trying to uh, uh, go to Silicon Valley and just trying to compete there. Maybe you probably need uh, some space to actually grow, understand your need. So Latin America offers that great place, as, and there's no better space to grow that in, than in Mexico, and I believe in Tijuana, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mexico has such natural uh, opportunities within that. So we have not a Chicago-based, we have a Chicago-based startup, but a LA-based startup uh, was thinking of doing uh, s their own startup uh, for the U.S. marketplace. Uh, we were, they were invited by the U.S. consul to Mexico, to Tijuana, so we talked about his model. And he, dis he discovered that there was a greater need in Latin America. So in one year, from shifting, just trying to discover this project, uh, he shifted from focusing on not only Latin America, but moving from a consumer base to a business model, uh, a B2B model, and actually went to Chile, uh, raised uh, a, a seed fund, has just finished the seed fund, announced last week he has two customers, one in Chile, one in Mexico, and he's actually growing, and after year two, he's going to expand to the U.S. And that's an L.A.-based startup that he probably wouldn't uh, achieve that if he started in, 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 in California, trying to do the regular route. So going to an underserved market that actually requires a lot of services, uh, it's, a better, uh, it's a better bet than actually trying to go into a crowded field in California. Ricardo, back to the question of space. You have a very secure space. Can you tell us a bit of the history of why it's such a secure space and why now it's such a hub for innovation and how does it bring people together? Okay. Well, we do have uh, probably one of the most secure spaces for innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, we're, uh, we're housed in an old U.S. Uh, consulate facility. Uh, we have a two-acre property, 55,000 square feet of buildings. Uh, so the walls are about two feet thick. Uh, <laughs> we took off about... 70 bulletproof windows. Uh, we still have some in sight, so some offices, you might be housed in an office with a startup that has an actual window where you used to go get your visa in Ciudad Juarez. Perhaps somebody here went and, and got their visa there. Um, so it's very secure, but it, <laughs> it, uh, it also, for us, you know, millions of people went there to get uh, a permit or a visa or, or, you know, get the dream, pursue the dream. And what we're doing, uh, we're, 
working with the U.S. consulate as, as we speak to get entrepreneurs and companies that we can help them cross over, uh, you know, with our ideas to, to change families and, uh, and to do that. And the space is very important because it allows, it allows it to be real. And what we've learned is that it brings anybody that would like to innovate. And this is entrepreneurs that would live, you know, we have an entrepreneur that travels 50 minutes to an hour from where he lives, down, you know, up north in, in Ciudad Juarez just for a boot camp. And then we, his friends start driving him back at night because they end late to companies. So the space, in my opinion, is very important. It's a place to mix it up. It's a place to bring art. It's a place, you know, we have an art department. We have the Fab Lab for Fabricators. Last month alone, we had 59 events. So we build a lot of content. And you get empowerment women, you get all this. And th this can happen in a space, like it can happen at the Mind Hub or, you know, or in universities as well. So for us, the space is very important. It's a, it's a place where we can evangelize about innovation and entrepreneurship. And it makes it real. Thank you. Now let's shift a little bit to. Uh, I keep saying a little bit. I'm going to stop saying a little <laughs> bit. Let's, uh, let's shift to uh, some very concrete, a very concrete issue related to starting and growing a business, which is access to capital, which I think you all have a perspective mm -hmm. on this. And it's a huge issue everywhere. Uh, it is a particularly uh, big issue here in border regions. And it is certainly a particularly big issue for Hispanics, for minorities, for women. Um, Tell us about what you're doing. What is your experience in access to capital and uh, how you are creating these opportunities or not? So it is an area that I nerd out on. I love um, access to capital. I think it makes a big difference between having an idea and then it being left in an idea and not taking the next step. So for me, access for female entrepreneurs to investors is, is a big um, thing that I like to look at. So for example, this weekend we have a conference at USD that will bring female entrepreneurs from all over the world and also investors. So I think we need to do a better job at um, helping to train females with high capital that want to invest, but they're not used to it. They're not used to high risk investment. Um, they've, they're used to a lot of men around them or other people making decisions for their money but not, not necessarily theirs. So I think there's something there. It's, it's not all figured out. We're learning as well, but I think there's groups of women. We actually have some women coming from the Emirates that are going to be sharing their story. So I think it's not just uh, this region. I think it's around the world, and this access to capital makes a big difference to seeing women succeed, succeed as entrepreneurs and actually launching their companies because many times they have a great idea, they, are, they have traction, but taking that next step is difficult because it's a constant no when they're trying to raise funds. So yeah, overall raising capital, that's kind of tricky. So um, let me start by saying there's no capital in, in Tijuana. There is some capital, but it's mostly focused on traditional like real estate type of, uh, of businesses. There's actually no um, fund that actually understands a tech startup. It's hard to really uh, uh, um, get them in, the, in that space. But overall in Mexico, that's fairly new. So in Mexico, I can say that there's no, fairly maybe one, two, they're kind of rare. So it's not really that much that you can go on. Even in San Diego, San Diego struggles a lot with uh, finding uh, capital. Uh, the same issues we've, we discovered, uh, most, mostly in real estate, not a lot of tech startups. Uh, a couple within the La Jolla mostly f focus on uh, uh, medical um, uh, medical and bio um, uh, solutions. Uh, uh, but now let me give you the other side. So one great advantage that San Diego has is actually if you're bootstrapping or if you have some seed funding, Mexico is a great way to expand your runway. So I mean we can actually, uh, that's a great way to be more efficient and actually if you're at your early stage, trying to figure out uh, uh, what's your next space, Mexico is a great place to actually have those resources. But also to discover and validate your your uh, your market. So again, San Diego is kind of high live, high cost of living, California, LA. Uh, I mean, Mexico you can do it for six months and actually spend that time in your product, in your company, uh, accessing customers from both sides of the border and actually growing and validating. Once you have a proven business model, capital is fairly easy. Uh, and the other advantage 
of, of Mexican startup is that we're so close to California, you, don't, you can actually incorporate in the U.S. Not only a Delaware-based company, but I actually have, have offices in downtown San Diego uh, and service your customers on either side of Latin America or, or, or the U.S. And that's a huge advantage to attract uh, funds from the U.S. I mean, a lot of U.S. investors are kind of iffy on investing on Mexican-based companies unless they have some experience. But if you're a U.S.-based company, an LRC or a corp, I mean, they won't have an issue if you have offices in San Diego. So I think that's a huge advantage that the city of San Diego should be thinking about expanding that uh, because we are uh, of, uh, able to provide a lot of new businesses uh, in, uh, incorporated in San Diego. And from there, um, even growing, even expanding, uh, we'll have some sort of advantage uh, of other resources. The other, and the final thing we do is we do understand that we have in Tijuana and San Diego limited resources. We want to leverage them. So we want to understand what resources uh, UCSD has, USD has, with Tijuana, WABC, CETIS, MindHub, uh, Hub, uh, and, and Juarez, and offer them to the community of entrepreneurs. Because in that, there's, if it's, not value, it's not capital, but there is resources that could help you grow and actually make you push. So that's like an alternative way to funding uh, startups. Ricardo, you have skin in the game in this capital question, so can you tell us about how that came to be and why? Sure. So um, I'm, uh, I'm part of a fund that got started in the border of Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, and uh, we have a venture fund called Sava Investments, and we invest in early stage companies. So, so this was a conversation by 13 leaders of the community. And we had many conversations come together and said, hey, can we build a fund that is a high risk vehicle that will invest in startups uh, that would help validate business models to take them to commercialization. And besides being a fund for these entrepreneurs, uh, you know, we all decided to put a little bit of capital, uh, set up the fund through many, many conversations and possibly you know, have failure with it because it takes a lot to do one of these funds. So for us uh, today, we're a fully subscribed fund. We've uh, invested into nine companies. Some are from the region, others are linked to the region. Uh, but the most important thing that we found that this capital does is that now we have 60 investors. 55% of them are from Mexico, 45% from the US have come together and they believe in investing into these type of companies. Mm -hmm. so, so it has been a great uh, vehicle to understand how we can improve our, our, our opportunities for startups and for smaller companies. Uh, in reference to, to the competitions that we do, we also started a coalition uh, called Innovation Frontera. And uh, through Innovation Frontera, we have a, an area called Innovation Frontera Sharks. So we run a competition and we invite some of these investors that are part of the fund to, to come and sit at the chair and be able to, you know, we call it spray and pray. So, <laughs> so you know, to, to give seed money for the initial just idea phase of this. So, you know, last year there was some spray and pray money. Uh, there's three companies that are still alive. And now they're getting ready to pitch to the Saba Fund, which is amazing. And, uh, and, and uh, so I encourage, you know, this region to come together, get a couple of, of thinkers in this process to build a fund. It doesn't require a lot. It just requires people coming together. That's, that's basically it. I was going to, thank you, Ricardo. I was going to ask both uh, uh, Regina and Guillermo. There is indeed this massive wealth in this region. Sure. Uh, a lot of it is Mexican. On both sides of the border, by the way, a lot of the wealth is, is, uh, is, of, uh, is of Mexican origin. Um, what would it take to unlock, let's call it unlock, but I mean like a, a desatorar esa riqueza? Uh, that is going into real estate for the most part. And by the way, this is not unique here. Being from Monterrey, I can see that. Uh, it's sad to see that in one business of Mexico, mm -hmm. the only thing you have going on are buildings. Well, that's not the only thing you have going on. There are many, many other things going on. But the question is, how do, what would it take to redirect that wealth? And Ricardo, maybe you can comment on how did that happen, you mm -hmm. know, in, in Juarez El Paso? You know, one of the remarkable things there is this, uh, the sophistication of the civic and business leadership that exists there and have this vision of the, of the economy. Mm -hmm. 
So I think what Ricardo said of the spray and pray <laughs> is something that culturally we struggle with. So what I've seen, sometimes it's easier to raise money if I show you a physical food truck and tell you how much it is than if I show you a pitch talking about a technology that you don't understand. So I think this new culture of investing and what I'm starting to see more is the, the third generation. So a family business, this third generation that has more of an understanding of technology, of what that means. So I think it's, you're right, I, I, the wealth is there, but there is a lack of understanding of what this angel, even angel investing means. What about growth capital? You know, there is almost this, this uh, gap. You have risk capital, we have big banks. What about the middle ground? Uh, I don't know if you can comment on that or anyone else there. I, I think, again, it has to do with the, the culture piece, because even, Understanding that type of investment is very different than understanding the investment of real estate or what we're familiar with. So I think uh, I'm very proud of the work you've done in El Paso and I think there's work that we could do in San Diego in that space because there is the net worth but maybe there's not the, the, the training and the understanding of what a good investment looks like, what you need to be looking for. That piece of it I think is a big one. Yeah, so overall, I mean, investors are not really they're risk averse, right? Even if they're willing to go to risk, they're not willing to risk their money uh, if they don't really understand that space. And it's hard to actually uh, pitch this general concept of what you want, and if you haven't had any proof of con uh, proof that actually will get them uh, to convince investors. So that's a challenge. Uh, there's, I mean, we need investors who really understand the tech space, understand what technology and what the future of uh, is coming. We tend to look at the past, not at the future. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. So my, uh, our company, our parent company, is 150 employees. It actually invoices about, uh, about the same that a large 300 building maquiladora uh, uh, invoices. So, and it's just one shift, not three shifts, and it's half the employees. That, mean, that should be the future of, of Tijuana, not the maquiladora model, but actually greater value more tech-based, scientific-based uh, startups. And that hasn't really permeated through within uh, the um, uh, business community and the investment community. There's only one, two, maybe three models in Tijuana. They're becoming more common. So it's going to take some time to actually get people to understand that this is the new economy of Tijuana, not the traditional manufacturing-based uh, model. Uh, and but the other thing we should be really aware is that maybe for the entrepreneur, it's not really in their best interest to raise money really early stage if they haven't really proven their model. So let's be very, very careful about that. If you don't have a proven model, don't go out and raise money. Wait until you have a proven model. That's why the resources are so important. Uh, you don't have like uh, spending on your credit card or you don't have like a rich uncle or a uh, that actually will give you like, oh, $50,000 to go and spend in Mexico. Uh, that's really not, not common in, in Mexico. So you really have to uh, hustle to get your product into the marketplace. Once you've proven, proven the, 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 the model and have some customers, then you should actually go to find those funds. So we're not really, really excited about those uh, really early stage uh, pitch competitions. We want them to have actual customers, a proven model, mm -hmm. and we'll help them get there, but that's probably the best place to start. Okay. Um, in, uh, in what we do, uh, we have seen that, yes, uh, uh, there's a lot of money on the south side. And there's a lot of money invested in real estate, uh, but what we have done is that through many conversations and uh, many meetups and talking to the economic development leaders of the community, we have been able to get them to understand our value proposition for the 21st century. And, uh, and we always call this you know, evangelizing about innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, I, I mean, I remember having these conversations. We have a pitch deck and we say, listen, we're trying to move the needle on this. Uh, will you give us some money so we can sponsor a project? They're like, nope, you guys always come to us for money. Today, the story is different because we've been at it. We've been evangelizing. We've been showing what's been happening. So, so I, would, I would say that, that capital is there. We just need to be showing the community leadership how they can invest a little bit of their money 
into these startup, you know, startup companies or already companies that are accelerating. Uh, we tell people, and this is what's going to happen, in the next 10 years from Technology Hub, we will build a unicorn. And that's a billion dollar company. And we'll be part of it. And we want the investors to be there and be part of this. So that's part of our, of our pitch to bring this community together to understand that risk money on startups is, and, and, and companies is a way to go. Uh, we have uh, time for questions. There are microphones uh, around the, uh, the uh, room. Uh, please wait for the microphone uh, to you. And let's start uh, on this side. One in front, two, yes. And then uh, this side. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Carmen Palafox, and I'm a venture investor. My focus is on manufacturing. And so I'm, I, I welcome risk. Mm -hmm. We are making our first investment into a Mexican SAPI. So I'm very excited about the cross-border opportunities. Um, at our venture fund, we also have an innovation hub where we support companies that are doing the internet of things, robotics, wearables. We do a lot of hosting for other countries, Singapore, um, China, all these delegations that come to learn more about how they can promote entrepreneurship. So I'm wondering how we can build that bridge with Mexico. What is Mexico doing to support innovation locally? Well, uh, there's, uh, so we should talk. I mean, one of the problem is within that, we, we support innovation. Uh, uh, within the manufacturing space, uh, it's kind of a hard sell, especially if we're talking about uh, risk and funding. If you want to uh, uh, fund a first run, it's still harder than just funding like a regular uh, s software startup. Uh, there's huge opportunity. We have in, in Baja and whole Mexico, a huge base of manufacturing uh, capabilities. And we have the talent, we have the expertise. Uh, we're really good at solving processes and, and we have the supply chain fully developed. What we don't really have is people who understand the future opportunities. They're still looking for foreign investment coming into the area and, and launching. We're, we need to generate that uh, intellectual property. On the scientific side, uh, we still haven't really developed uh, a scientist who are willing to leave academia and research and actually launch their own startups. And, and bridging that scientific and business side is a huge issue. So uh, we're pushing that uh, forward. So I think those two are the challenges. Um, getting people to skip uh, the traditional contract manufacturing model to actually innovate and go after uh, that higher uh, return type model uh, and, and getting uh, the, the scientific and, 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 and community to think about it not in terms of science, more in terms of business. Ricardo, any comment there? Or? Uh, on, on what we have seen, uh, and I'd love to connect and, and, and you know, get our business cards, uh, you know, on the three levels of, of engagement for our community, which it's, you know, if it's public, uh, we have seen the Mexican side of the government starting to step up. Uh, the Secretary of Innovation, for instance, just sponsored, is the, you know, one of our larger sponsors for a huge event that we do in November. It's a binational event. So they're stepping up to, to you know, putting money on this. Uh, on, the, uh, on the businesses uh, or, you know, or the companies across the border, they're also part of our investors. So, so they're understanding, you know, the, the ways to, to, to do this. And uh, on the manufacturing side, it is, as you say, difficult to, to, to build a startup in that sector. However, manufacturing is also partnering up with what we're doing. I mean, we've done 12 of the leading manufacturing, uh, you know, connections and, and uh, collaboration agreements within the last year. So, so it, it all comes together the more content that you can bring them. Uh, for us has been an experience that, that, that government is stepping up, uh, the local leadership is stepping up, and also the industry in our case. Thank you. Uh, there was a question, Vincent. Yeah, yeah let's, see if I can, let's, let's see if I can articulate this. So there's some themes here about exclusion, inclusion, differentiation, 
uh, something that's very new, trying to make things happen that haven't happened before, and so on. And I'm, I'd like to hear some comments about the actual role or the potential role or the shortcomings of media. And I mean the whole thing. I mean local broadcast media, uh, uh, the internet, magazines, and so on. For example, I'm aware that public television in Los Angeles has had some extremely interesting series uncovering um, Latino Mexican entrepreneurship in very strange, uh, very unexpected. For, for example, a lot of the artisans who create this very high-end, cutting-edge accoutrements for very rich people in Los Angeles, they're these unknown Mexicans who are working in these workshops. And so uh, you haven't addressed media uh, yeah. so far in the conversation, and I'd just like to know if you have something interesting to say about that. Um, so Vincent, nice to meet you. So I think that's a very interesting question, and the, it immediately took me to the new media. So now, in a way, we all create our own media with a tweet, with what we share on social media. So we're getting information from a lot of places at the same time. So before, we would buy the newspaper, or we would go to a media outlet. But that, right, the relationship that we have to media is very different now. So I think um, that changes a lot of things. So maybe that, that Latino entrepreneur that is, wouldn't have never been discovered by a media outlet because their pitch would have never gone through. Now they have an ability to have visibility by getting followers, by building traction, by using that as a free um, way to brand their ideas and their company. So I think there's both sides. So you can argue towards that you know the media only, only covers one side of the issue, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity now with the openness to create your own media and to communicate your own message and story. I, I'd like to add to that as well. Um, media for us, when we got started, uh, zero budget for marketing. Uh, well, actually, we did do like $50 in Facebook or something. But, uh, but uh, we started with a communication department, then we called it a social media department, and today we call it Hub Media. So Hub Media allows uh, either companies or entrepreneurs or local leaders to showcase uh, a project each week. And we have these Hub Talks that we do every week, for example. So we have somebody that will do an interview on a Tuesday, they'll present on a Thursday, and by, by Thursday evening, they'll have about 4,000 followers. This is somebody that is just talking about a local idea or a local project. So media for us has been more of the, of the uh, internet media than, than, uh, than the traditional media models. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Um, just, uh, again, we focus more on social media. Um, and our focus is actually not like the flashy news site. It's actually building a community. And that support of that community is great, like events like this, we're creating a community. But guess what? That community becomes future investors, customers. So that has a greater value than just getting like uh, our spot on the TV news mm -hmm. cycle. So building that community is of greater value than actually being on, on a newspaper. There's a question back here. Yeah. Dr. Francisco Valle, uh, I have uh, two related questions. What is preventing these big time Silicon Valley type of investors for going into Mexico, in your opinion? Because for instance, they, they invest in all kinds of crazy ideas. If we have, say six years ago, we're going to invest in a hotel chain with no rooms. We're going to invest in a taxi company with no taxes. We all have laugh, right? But there are some of them that look for those kind of things. On the other hand, Right. What is preventing uh, companies as well as uh, Mexican companies or organizations as well as the Mexican government for promoting, you know, what they can offer? Because it's nothing for these investors to go to India, to go to Scotland, you know, go all over the world. But why Mexico is not there? Well, I mean, uh, we've had a couple of venture funds from Silicon Valley come to our space and look at what we're doing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a fund called Hackers and Founders. They've been there. They're doing business in Latin America. And the advantage they see, so these are the, you know, the, 
the early adopters, they see they can find companies for cents on the dollar. And you can build them. And then you can take them over to the, you know, to the global markets. So uh, we have seen that that started to happen in our space. I'll be brief. Uh, yeah, so even San Diego hasn't seen in seven years the influx of Silicon Valley capital. So it's not going to happen really in, in Mexico. What needs it's we need an angry bird. So that's a huge successful company that will build companies around and that happened in Norway. And, and, and that model should be replicated in, 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 some, in some ways. And, and finally, um, within the space of, uh, of uh, investors and, and, and actually attracting uh, funds, we should really understand uh, what the, the value is. So let's say a million dollars for a US-based startup, if you want to have like 10 times uh, the return, that's great. A million dollars in Mexico will actually offer you more time to actually create and spend that, but actually the return is the similar. So maybe you don't invest a million dollars in Mexico, you maybe invest a third or a half to get the same time a return. So we need to understand that that's, uh, space. Anything to add there? Mm -hmm. uh, Guillermo and then Paul back there. Thank you. I'm sorry, Gustavo. Gustavo. I was, uh, I was looking at Guillermo and I turned to Gustavo, Don't so worry. I got confused. I'm Gustavo with, with Smart Board Coalition. I'm going to issue a challenge for you. Uh, you talked about the entrepreneurial spirit that we have here on the border. You talk about the uniqueness of the border. Uh, that's all in good, but the challenge is this. We have a lot of issues that Carlos was talking about initially about the uh, optimization of flows. That, that's sort of the narrative, right? It, but it is an important part of that narrative, and it is something you have to work on. If we got together as entrepreneurs, if your organizations uh, of entrepreneurs got together and said, you know, let's, let's really do create an imprint for what the border is going to look like from a Internet of Things, from a uh, intelligent, tra intelligent transportation systems point of view, from a wait time point of, point of view, let's try to resolve the local binational problem that we have here, because as you know, El Paso Juarez has the same issues. Laredo has the same issues. So why don't we create that uniqueness? We improve on that uniqueness by taking on our entrepreneurs and working on the problems and the challenges that we have from a border innovation perspective right on the border. Gustavo, is that an invitation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> for, a, for, a, for a competition. Is it an invitation? So I, the first thing that comes to mind as well is this whole village of support. So to land at the conversation you're speaking about, you're going to need to bring in a lot of different parts. So I think the universities will play a huge component of support on the startup ecosystem. And then I think uh, something that I would love to see more is businessmen that have paved the way. I think the Smart, Bo Smart Border Coalition gave us an incredible infrastructure of support, but also bringing in new minds and new ideas and really seeing it like a design thinking problem of how do we creatively look at the border? What are, it's changed a lot over the, and it will continue to change. So I think it's really mapping it out. I think San Diego has an incredible spirit of collaboration that we're very fortunate to see. So it's going to take a whole binational village of support, bringing universities, business, um, the, both cities together to have the conversations. I love the design thinking idea for this. I think I think the border. I think we should think look at the border as a as a design problem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a set of constraints, with a set of opportunities, with a you know, and just thinking about it in that way. It's a, yeah. it makes should, me we, curious. We, we, let, we should all <laughs> talk about this anyway. Uh, uh, yeah. So I, I will focus more on on immigration and, and and the requirements of highly skilled workers for California and Silicon Valley. So. Uh, so the business, you need like a million engineers in California to actually keep up the growth. Uh, and the visa is like going from, from 100,000 to 50,000 a year. So Tijuana offers a great opportunity. Uh, so for example, Amazon is looking for a second corporate headquarters in America. So why don't we pitch it San Diego, Tijuana uh, offices with an expansion to the Tijuana to actually uh, lower barrier for in, uh, uh, um, migrant workers in Tijuana with a H1 crossing to actually service and work with the U.S. corporation. So those types of solutions would be great to actually increase 
uh, jobs and technology and diversity within the border region. For everybody. Right? Yeah, for everybody. And, and allowing people from Latin America, from India, from um, Eastern Europe uh, to actually establish and service the, the greater uh, innovation sector in California. It's a great challenge. And uh, I think we all touch upon it a little bit as we go through our days uh, working with entrepreneurs. I, um, something that comes to mind is that what each one of us does, uh, and I would say it's, there's always uh, a budget factor on doing things and making things happen. So we always have just so much available to resources, whether they're monetary or their time constraint or people that help us to make this happen. I mean, I, I, I take in the challenge and I'm going to be looking to do something on our border to be able to, to impact that. That's a great idea to be able to do something, as you mentioned, with Amazon. No, no, no. Amazon is for Tijuana San Diego. No, no, no. <laughs> well, but I, I, I didn't tell you we've already, we're, we're in deep conversations. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Or, or, any, or any entities like that. I mean, it's a great challenge to take and we have to take it as a community. Mm -hmm. It takes many people coming together to make that happen. It's just not you know, a small group. So I would end it at getting a lot of people together to make that happen. The last question back there, uh, well, two questions. Uh, the, it's one back there, uh, Paul, and then here, well, three. We can share it. Yeah. Hi. My name is Dante Alvarado Leon. I'm a software and platform senior research analyst at Accenture. Uh, I was born and raised in San Diego, Tijuana. I used to cross the border every morning and go to school. And my question to all of you is how can we get the youth involved in innovation entrepreneurship? I left San Diego to stay in Silicon Valley. Over there when I was at Berkeley, launched two companies, um, and I just learned a lot. And now I come back and I see all my friends working at Pizza Hut, or they decided to stay at a community college. What can we do to make sure that talent comes back, or that talent stays here, or stays within borders, within the border, and really spur the economy? I think we, there's a lot that can be done. And from a university standpoint, from having accelerators, what can we do here so that we want to come back and start our own companies and have the support? Because when I pitched to investors, this, the room did not look like this. It was a lot of people that looked very different from me. Yeah. So how, how can we teach and how can we do that? I will ask if you could be Very brief, brief so that we can get the last two questions yeah. because I know that we have. Uh... I will be brief. Dante, let's connect after. Uh, <laughs> and there, there is a lot going on um, right now in San Diego, Tijuana. And I don't think th this conversation of keeping talent in San Diego, it's okay if you go and you go explore, if you bring your talent back with you at some point. So I would love to connect with you and see um, how we can get you more involved in what we're trying to do. So, yeah, so the Latino, uh, not only the Latin Americans underserved, but the Latinos in the U.S. are underserved. So that's a huge opportunity. That's a huge opportunity for businesses to focus on the, just the Latinos in, 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 in the United States. And within that space, education is one of the, the, those uh, things we need to serve better Latino communities. I would say just reach out to your to, to local uh, coalitions that are making this happen and have this mindset. Uh, and I would say become one of those leaders that can come, you know, bring people together. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, um, I'm Paul Robin. I'm with the university here. Hi, guys. Um, I, I actually wanted to build on what uh, he had said, and given that we have little time, maybe I'll just make a quick comment. Um, Guillermo, you said, you know, one of the issues is we need to bring scientists together with business people. I, sure. I think that's absolutely true, but I think it's more than that. I think business schools t uh, teach um, managers. They don't teach leaders. Uh, we really need to be incubating entrepreneurs, we need to be incubating leaders. Um, and I don't think we pay enough attention to that. I mean, mentorship, as you mentioned, is part of that. Um, but it's certainly our responsibility as a university to do that. And as a region, I'd love to know, you know, get ideas on how we can do it. How can we really incubate people as opposed to companies? Um, create people who, you know, can work with risk, who can influence from positions where they have no authority, who really can work in the realm of what's possible rather than what's probable. Create more of that guy down there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, we don't have enough entrepreneurs in this region, not in San Diego, not in Tijuana. Uh, I'd love to sort of get a discussion going on how we can do that. Thank you. Uh, can we leave it as a comment or do you want? Yeah, all right. And then the last one here. Thank you. 
Good morning, and thank you for sharing with us. My name is Marisa. I work at the International Community Foundation, and my question is about philanthropy. Have you seen philanthropy at the table using tools like impact investing, social impact bonds? Do you think there's a better way to bring philanthropy at the table? What's happening there? Um, so at the University of San Diego, we're very, we do a lot of work with social entrepreneurship, so we're very vigilant about what's going on with the social entrepreneurship impact investing. So I, I think it's very much at the table, but it ne needs to continue to be the understanding of business is not just for business, but there's a lot of impact that can be made. So I think the reframing of what philanthropy looks like in this age of difference, I think is a very interesting conversation that's ongoing. I agree with Regina. We, we are interested in social entrepreneurship, uh, but we need to move from the philanthropy model into a real social entrepreneurship model. Mm -hmm. In our case, we have seen uh, social innovation happening. We've seen entities as a Borderplex Alliance, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations stepping up and, uh, and uh, <coughs> allowing us to, to give us a little bit of runway. We've seen uh, individuals come up and, and write checks. So, so our community is, is, uh, is building a new wave of, un of uh, philanthropist, as I see it, coming from a grassroots movement. Give us one last thought that you want us to keep before we step uh, from the stage. So no pressure. Uh, one last parting <laughs> one last thought. thought. The final <laughs> one call to action, one um, inspiration, one thing to leave, to leave us. Uh, food for thought. Food for thought. So at a country level, we're neighbors, but San Diego, Tijuana, we're roommates. So we're very influenced by each other. We even have some phrases that uniquely we share that if we went further into Mexico, they would not understand. And we have an opportunity to create our own story. We're, as you said, pioneers, and there, there will, it will take a lot of different groups coming together, but I'm excited what we can create at the city level, and there's a lot of openness and collaboration. Uh, I'll repeat the Frontera Founders slogan. So uh, we actually, it, there's, we don't see a border. We actually believe that is a new frontier. There's great space to explore, so I invite you to explore that uh, new frontier, new opportunities for your businesses. I would say that innovation is on the driver's seat for the new 21st century economy. If you guys are going to invest your time, if you're going to invest your money, invest it in innovation, uh, in anything that's happening in innovation for, for this new economy. Thank you very much for a great conversation. Uh, thank you, Regina, thank you. Guillermo, Ricardo. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. We have a 20-minute break. We will be, we ask you that to be back here in the room right at 11. Uh, AM for the next panel on the creative economy, on how embracing culture and community also creates these wonderful opportunities here at the border. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you.
Angela Celorio, I'm the Consul General of Mexico in San Diego, and uh, I was asked uh, to participate here today uh, to have a, a good conversation with these uh, three main actors in the uh, issue of culture and uh, how to build community and awareness and, uh, and how to help our youngers. So, um, first of all, I'm not going to read your bios because I think that all the people here that is attending already uh, knew about yourselves. But maybe there are, uh, you know, parts or details that are not included in your bios, that are not officially uh, there. So maybe, uh, James, uh, we can start with you if you can uh, tell us, um, you know, you're an architect, right? Yes. And uh, maybe you can tell us uh, how come you became an architect and uh, if that decision now, with all the, the, these things that you're doing in uh, Logan Heights, um, is helping this, um, you know, this background. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everyone for attending. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a, actually a failed furniture maker. <laughs> I, I went to architecture school, but when I got out, the economy wasn't so good. So I tried to make a living doing art and furniture for several, several years. And um, currently, I, I, I kind of work in a, a, a loose triangle of, of occupations in a way. One is um, my, I'm an architect with my firm called Public Architecture in Logan Heights. In a, another corner of the triangle, I operate uh, with several other people, Bread and Salt, a community art center in Logan Heights also, in the same building. <laughs> Makes it convenient that way. And we're, we're new. We've, we've been around for five and a half years now. Okay. It was an old Weber bakery. And at the other corner of the triangle, and I think I'm floating in, in around, I'm kind of like a fly hitting the walls of the triangle. <laughs> at the other, the third corner, um, it started out as, a, a, I think, a small study that I did. I, was a, I spent a year in 2008, 2009 at Harvard on a Loeb Fellowship. And I, okay. I went there with the intention to uh, study the idea of making a border city, a city on the border between San Diego and Tijuana. And, but the, at the end of the year, I ended up uh, studying the possibility of a, a true binational park on that site at the site of Friendship Park. And uh, when I got back from the one-year fellowship, I, I had found that the Border Patrol had built the second fence, which had cut off access to the inner fence, a very, very important meeting space. So I spend my time these days kind of cycling back through somewhere in between all of those important elements. And let me ask you something. Wh where are you originally from? I'm from, I was born in Newfoundland, Canada. My dad okay. was uh, in... Uh, oh, wait, there's, an, there's not another Newfoundlander in this room, I'm sure. But my dad was in the U.S. Navy. Okay. Uh, and uh, we, so I never lived in a place for more than 18 months until I entered uh, high school, so. Likewise. Okay. <laughs> no, well, I hope to stay even more here. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm used, to, I'm used to moving around, but I ended up in San Diego, and uh, it slowly became a, a real home. And it's kind of odd when you're someone that always moves around all... You, yes. you don't have a place to like uh, center yourself. It takes a lot of years to do that. Yes. Yeah, because, well, my question was that because I wanted to know how come you got involved with the uh, border dynamics. Why think about uh, binational or cross-border city and, you know, that it's, stuff. Uh, it's the most important topic of the region to be a practitioner in San Diego. If you just work north of the border line, then you're missing a very important kind of tool or, or ingredient to your practice. And also, there's the idea that it's something that must be confronted you know, by all of us. Our best, they talk about, it seems like to be a narrative uh, in the United States that security, security is very important, so perhaps we need this wall. But our most important security, in fact, is our friendship uh, with the common, uh, the, with the citizens of Mexico uh, alongside the citizens of the United States. That's true security. Well, I'm glad that you. Well, I'm happy that you acknowledge this <laughs> because not everybody, you know. Um, now I would like to, to ask uh, Jesse. Um, 
I read your, your bio, but I think that there are uh, something that is missing, like uh, all the hazards that you have been facing, like being a homeless. How come, if you can tell us about um, it? Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, one of the one of the issues that that I grew up with is actually um, we were very unstable. My family, um, I grew up in a in a very chaotic home. Um, it was a a lot of abuse in, in in my in my family, and we we were where I'm actually from Los Angeles, California. Um, my my mom's from Guadalajara, and my dad's from El Salvador. Um, you know, it, it's. It was it was pretty hard. It was pretty hard growing up with with uh, with a family that's just kind of broken down, you know, and um, the fear of of having that abuse in the house is is very it was very tough. So um, it was a point where we we couldn't really function together. So we had to break apart, and everybody went their own way. I have um, brothers like down in Los Angeles that. Um, you know, had to just kind of detach from our family. And um, me and my mom, we actually ended up coming to San Diego. You know, my mom had to get away from, from everything that was going on with, with my dad. And um, uh, we, she, she, we came over here. She, she believed that there was something else, you know, something different. She's just kind of trying to figure out how to get us away from all of that, you know. And um, knowing that, that, well, not knowing, you know, that, there wasn't really too much of of a opportunity, I guess. You know, when we came here, we saw that the rent was so much higher, and you know, we we figured, oh my gosh, like you know, what are we doing here? But we didn't have any money. You know, spending spending our cash is pretty much like trying to find a little place, a little room, somewhere to go to, like just trying to to have some kind of roof over our heads. You know, and um, we ended up figuring out, hey, you know, let's go to Mexico. Like, let's, let's try to figure out how to, how to live a, a life that's, that's going to be a little cheaper. You know, we figured that a lot of the people that we knew were, like, down over there saying, hey, the rent is, like, $200 for, like, this, you know? And we said, okay, you know, let's go down there. And um, we ended up staying over there. And actually, for a while, we ended up just staying with our family, <laughs> you know, just... Um, just trying to figure out how to not struggle so much, you know. And one of the main struggles is actually crossing the border. And I can really relate to one of the students here, you know, saying that uh, crossing the border every day, we, it's, it's, we have to wait about maybe three to four hours in line. And me coming from Rosarito, which was a little further than, than Tijuana, I would have to wake up early. We didn't have a car, you know, we didn't have anything. We had to go on foot. so. Um, we would have to wait for the taxi in the morning, and like, cause um, there are certain like, I guess, uh, neighborhoods you have mm -hmm. to get out and then go to the main roads, um, and it, it was a it was a struggle. Three forty seven in the morning every day, you wow. know, and um, having to go from there to downtown little little Italy to go to school and uh, having the front desk woman tell you, Jesse. You need to wake up a little earlier, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, me standing in line like four hours and just like falling asleep, practically standing, you know, it was it was really hard. And um, but l like knowing that it was worth fighting for that education, you know, that um, that the opportunities are, are, are extremely different. And we have to realize that, you know, and um, but was there like a breaking point? How old were you when you were in Rosarito? When I was in Rosarito? Uh, well, it was back and forth. So okay. if we couldn't find a place here, we had to go back. Wow. You know, because um, other than that, we were in shelters. So we were in like rescue mission, St. Vincent's. Like, um, it was just so many, so many different situations. We were just never in one place, you know? And, yeah. and it's really, it was really unstable. Um, when, when it was my, my own breaking, breaking point, um, so my, my mother had this relationship with um, uh, my stepdad and it was very hard to deal with that. He was an alcoholic and um, there was also abuse there. You know, it was more of a verbal and like he would, uh, he would leave and after he would leave, um, I was the only one there with her. So 
everything would kind of fall on me. So it would be more of like a blame game, you know, like it would be my fault. And her mm -hmm. own, her own um, issues started coming onto me, you know. So after a little bit of, of that, like it was just my breaking point in saying, you know what, like I can't, I can't take the abuse, you know, I can't take it anymore. And, and I ended up being a runaway, a runaway teen at 16. Um, I ended up going to a shelter called Storefront. And from there, you know, I said, like, I'm just going to, I'm going to make it, you know, I'm going to try to make it out of here, you know, I'm going to try to make that change. And not only for me, like, there are so many youth out there that are going through the same thing that I currently know, you know, and um, I've gone to different programs and I'm currently like still visiting these programs. And it's, it's a really hard situation to see that um, these, these age groups, you know, we kind of just tuck them away. You know, these, these situations where um, we see homeless people and, and we've gotten so used to it that we kind of just, oh, you know, like turn the other way. Let's just walk across the other street because the street is full. Why is it full? Why, why are these people out there? You know, and, and if we realize how many of them are youth, you know, how many of them could be in, in such higher positions and have so much opportunity. And the opportunities out there, the thing is, outreach is very, is very complicated, you know. And um, so for me, one of the things that, that, um, that I like doing is with art, you know, I like communicating with people. So um, I, I'm actually working on an um, on organization that's going to be launching in, in October. And um, I will be using, you know, graphic design and um, T-shirts and art to just pretty much spread out this information and spread out awareness, you know, that there, there are youth that have this potential, you know, that, that, um, that there's just so much power, you know, but we, we have to be heard, you know, there, there has to be a way for us to be able to reach it, you know, so. Great. Well, now I'm, we are going to talk with David Favela for a while. Uh, when I saw the branding, I was asking you, that it was a Border X Brewing in Barrio Logan or Border Cross, right? <laughs> and you said it's that is, it's both. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, when we thought about the branding, uh, we were located originally right at the border in Otay Mesa. So we're like, well, we're the southernmost brewery in all San, you know, San Diego, all California, maybe in the U.S. And we said the border is something important to us and defines us. And so we started playing around with words like frontera and this, that. But, you know, we finally settled on Border X. And it means so much to us from a variety of perspectives. Um, we are children. Of, I am a child of the border. Uh, my nephews grew up in, who are the brewers, were in Playas de Tijuana, mm -hmm. yet they graduated from SDSU as well. So this border has just been a central element to our entire life. Um, and so when we thought about who we were going to be as brewers, we thought, well, we're not Irish, we're not German, we're not you know, Polish or Czech or any of those you know, uh, cultural traditions where brewing is a, a strong tradition. We're, we're Mexicans, and yet you know, we know how to brew, so how do we put those two things together? And that fusion is why we called it Border X, X really standing for anything that you want it to stand for, whether it's crossing borders in flavor okay. and mixing up a, a traditional European brewing tradition with Latino or Mexican flavors, or whether it's artwork or whether it's our decor, our marketing, everything about us is about that fusion. And um, so that's why we decided <laughs> to do it that way. And I was just reflecting on some of the personal stories from the earlier panel, and it suddenly dawned on me that it's so consistent in my life that the border has been a central element. So we came from Durango northern state, Sierra Madre, a little village there, ranchers. And uh, my father first came to Tijuana and lived there and had brothers and, that grew up there. And, but I was born in the U.S., so there's this really interesting spread of our family from Mexicano as Mexicano comes <laughs> mm -hmm. to my youngest sister. I'm the second youngest who, does, who, who struggles with, with Spanish, right? Yes, that's, that's what I read about. Yeah. And so just within my own family, there's this huge spectrum of assimilation that has happened. And, and so it's kind of ironic that at this stage of my life, one of the most important businesses I've launched is actually about the border. So from, from the beginning to the present, it's been a continuous element in my life. Well, yes, in your bio I read that you had this uh, fight with the bilingual education. Yes. And that was the problem. 
Yeah. And uh, I remember that when I arrived here in San Diego a year ago, remember that we talk about uh, being bilingual and uh, I had a challenge with my, with my kid. Even we, we were posted in Washington DC and my kid was uh, six years old and they told me that I had to choose between or either Spanish or English, but he cannot do both. So what will be your message? Because you have been, you know, on your own skin, you have had that experience. So what would be the message uh, pro bilingual education and the importance to, and the, that we are able to do that? Yeah. I don't know if everyone read the, read the bio, but I had a terrible experience, not uncommon to a lot of children that are born in California to immigrant parents. They didn't know what to do with us. I was before bilingual education, so I showed up at school and I was one of the few Latinos. Mm -hmm. And they would apply the traditional IQ tests. You know, I remember the, the square pegs and the round holes and all, you know, all kinds of different tests and they determined I was learning disabled. And instead of going to the school two blocks away from my home where I could walk easily, I was sent across town to a special education school by bus. And uh, yeah, it was an awful experience. And I was blessed though, because even in you know, great tragedy, there's, there's always hope. Um, I hid in the library and taught myself to read. And it was very funny, because the first book I remember pulling down, uh, I saw a picture of a gentleman flying through the air with little wings on his ankles. And I said, what the heck is that? And uh, you know, Greek mythology is actually a classical education where most private schools start is in Greek mythology. And that just is what really got me reading. And eventually by the fourth grade, they figured out that I wasn't learning disabled. I was actually a bookworm <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but my advice is real simple. And it's the same advice my father gave me is, you know, mijo, you know, you learn English, but keep your Spanish. It's going to be a huge asset to you in the future. And it has. It's defined me. And, you know, I work at HP now. I was actually an expatriate in Guadalajara and Silicon mm -hmm. Valley of Mexico. I helped start up uh, a whole manufacturing operation down there back in uh, early, gosh, what was it, um, 2010. And now Guadalajara is also a booming tech hub. Yes. And um, so having that ability to just shift, you know, language, vocabulary, culture, all those elements, and still be effective in any situation, how could that not be a gift? Of course. Yeah, I see it that way, too. And James, um, I want to, to ask you something. I'm, I'm coming from New York. And you know, New York has a different uh, dynamic. And Los Angeles, even, has a different dynamic. Uh, I think that it's a challenge here in San Diego. What you're doing with this uh, place that you're building, uh, Bread and Salt, and these I uh, read also about these pedestrian uh, walkways, mm. and, mm. uh, and I found, find that fantastic. But I think that there's a challenge to, to build community and to how to encourage this community to get involved in arts and participate, uh, like in a big city. So can you tell us about that? You're, you're talking about the, the perceived difference between the, the level and quality of the arts in San Diego and, and other large cities in the world. <laughs> and I, I think it is. Uh, I'm a diplomat. That's why I, I put it that way. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say it too long. And, I, and I, used to, I used to believe that. And, and when I first heard about this, uh, I, I was a young architect. Mm -hmm. And all the young architects were saying, there's nothing happening here. You know, nothing's going on here. We got to get out of here. We got to go to LA. We'll work here for a couple of years. You know, get our licenses, go to LA, go to New York, go to a big city, and become famous. Mm -hmm. But uh, I found that it's really a state of mind. You can do exactly what you want to do right in your own city, and and try. If you, it only takes four, three, four, five people to make a movement in any city, and you see that in, in art history, in architectural history. All the movements are created by a teeny group of people that their influence has spread. And the same thing can happen and will happen in San Diego. It is happening in the arts, I, I believe. Um, a lot of artists still have that knee-jerk reaction where they're not making it, but they might make it somewhere else. But I'm seeing an arts community now, and it's not only San Diego, but it's our region, the artists from Tijuana and San Diego combined, that are making a huge difference in the, on the world stage. And, uh, I, I think we are going to do it in our own city. Okay, and I'm going to ask you something else. 
Um, if San Diego uh, wasn't here along the border, close to the border, and was, you know, in the Midwest somewhere else, do you think it will be the same? Or the border has something that, you know, uh, impacts this uh, city? Oh, d definitely. There's, there's no doubt the, the strength of uh, two cities next to each other, two very different cities. I think one can potentially strength, strengthen the other to a great degree. And it was interesting in the panel before us, it, was, it seemed like it was difficult for the entrepreneurs, at least in Tijuana uh, or in Mexico, to break through uh, a certain wall, a barrier. I think in art and architecture, it's different. I think the power of the arts kind of re reverberates back and forth between the cities and is making a stronger impact. And you're seeing, you're, we are seeing that uh, in, in other writings, like the New York Times was writing about architecture and art in, in, t in the Tijuana area yeah. all the time. And food, yeah. food, be, food being one of the arts. And the LA Times, the same thing. It's, uh, it's, it is explo it's absolutely exploding the influence of Tijuana on San Diego and the whole world. Uh, and at, at, you know, at Bread and Salt, uh, it's a, I operate, a, it used to be a Weber bakery, a 45,000 square foot building, quite a large building. And um, we bought it six years ago. We, the, the corporation, Weber, sold it. And we were actually not the highest bidder. We were the lowest bidder. Oh. But the other entries into the project, they said that they, they wanted to, because we were asked to write a narrative, what we were going to do. They were typical developers. They wanted to tear down the building mm -hmm. and do housing projects. And I said, I, I want to use every aspect of the existing building, uh, build additional square footage. Uh, but turn it into a uh, community arts building. And, they, and it's interesting that Weber had already a history of, of community outreach. They were there since the first corner of Weber's was built in 1896. Wow. Um, on, and that, that corner is still there at Bread and Salt. And so for many decades, they've had a community room on the second floor that they've allowed uh, people in the community to have birthday parties, weddings, mm -hmm. dances. And so we get. We get people in their 80s and 90s like come up the stair, and they say, you know, there used to be a place that I Isn't went to a wonderful. high school high school dance. I said, I know what you're talking about. It's right there. And I take them in there, and they kind of like look around, like sort of stunned. And you can see they're sort of remembering. Wow. So there's this really long history at uh, Bread and Salt of community outreach, and so we're 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 continuing that legacy. And uh, some of the things we, we sort of have a, a rule of thumb that uh, any of any uh, anyone in our neighborhood within a couple few blocks radius, they could have any event, any event they want for any no matter how small the group, whether it's a meeting or a family birthday party or something, and they can we just allow it to happen. So this is this is was this has been our introduction into the community and for the six years and it. It's, it's helped, you know, because we are outsiders. There's no doubt about it. Yes. And we have to introduce ourselves in, a, I think, an open, positive way. And that's what we try and do. Fantastic. Well, now uh, talking about the border, and we cannot uh, be remiss in saying about uh, Jesse, if you can tell us, you, you lived in Mexico, and you experienced Mexico. And nowadays, there are a lot of uh, you know, uh, Mexico is facing insecurity, violence, uh, but nevertheless, you made it. Uh, a lesson I learned when I was posted in the Middle East is that, yes, there are a lot of problems, you know, that uh, we face as uh, countries, as a population, but uh, you keep on walking and you keep on doing things. So can you tell us about that experience? Because you were in this... Uh, complicated, to say the least, ambience, but you, you succeed. You're 21st, 21 years old, and you're pretty mature. And how can you tell us about that? Um, what um, can you tell us? Mature, OK, there we go. Yes. Um, 
Well, one of the things is um, there, there was uh, a lot of violence, and I had actually a lot of the students from my school tell me, you know, how do you, how do you cross the border every day? Like, don't you see these things going on? Aren't you afraid? And um, I mean, no, <laughs> you know, um, I, I did see a lot of things, and, and there was a lot of things happening, but one of the things that, that I would say, you know, like, I, I love, I feel like my heart comes from Mexico, you know, like everything that I've been through over there, everything that all of the people that I knew, all the youth that I, that I, that I come to, to just grow so closely to, um, it made it worth it, you know. And uh, one of my goals was to actually create a program in Mexico for that, for the youth, you know. Uh, I love art and I feel like that was my, my escape, you know, my, my way of actually rising up to the top, you know, for, for, for me, that, that was my, my staircase up, you know, and uh, I, I noticed that there was no after school programs, there was no, you know, there was nothing that, that got students to focus on anything else but to be in the streets, you know, but to be um, in gangs, but to be in, in trafficking, you know, narcotraficantes, and, and, uh, there was a lot of that activity in, in that neighborhood, you know, so um, I decided, wow, like there's so many things that, that there's so many opportunities here, like why not share that, you know, so um, anytime I was able to, to get a canvas, anytime I was able to get paint, anytime I was able to do anything like that, I would actually um, make presentations, you know, in high school and I still have the files of the presentations and um, collect these things and take it to 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 the youth over there you know so um, just being able to to have that that just picture of seeing like the youth touch a canvas for the first time and say oh my gosh you know like like oh que bonito like it's just <laughs> something that that I felt was worth it you know and and it made me not not have that fear you know yeah. because me coming from that background of, of poverty, you know, like there was moments where we didn't have food here or over there, you know, so um, being able to, to see that I'm making a difference in somebody else's life, that makes a difference in mine. So um, just, you know, I, I, I didn't fear it at all. But what would you say now, nowadays we're facing this uh, new, uh, well, the end of uh, DACA, the mm -hmm. executive order, and uh, now Congress have six months to to legislate about it, and there are a lot of uh, dreamers mm -hmm. uh, that are identifying more being Americans than Mexicans, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of fear among the community. Uh, how come I'm going to go back to Mexico? And you were lucky because you had the experience to live there, but okay. some of them haven't. Uh, they were very little small when they mm -hmm. came here. So, um, what would you say, how would we address that fear? And uh, how can we help to integrate, maybe through culture, uh, arts, uh, these uh, young people that identify as Americans and maybe they're going to face this uh, decision to go back to Mexico? Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually one thing. Um, Wow, it, it, it breaks my heart, really, because I have a lot of friends that, that, that have been crossing the border also because of DACA, you know, and, and that have been getting that opportunity. Um, they have visas, and so mm -hmm, they, yeah. they, they were able to, to, to come, and um, they have permits to be able to work, you know, like, so being able to, to have that opportunity taken away from you, and then having the students here that were actually from here, a lot of the friends that I have in Los Angeles, too, you know, they were brought here when they were six, five, you know, some of them not knowing anything else, they don't remember anything from Mexico. So it is something that's, that's, that's really hard. And um, I feel I'm, I'm trying my best also to, to get information for students who, who are currently getting off of DACA, you know, because um, there, there's a lot of resources out there, scholarships that, that actually support um, students who, who want to continue going to school. You know, and um, um, just a couple of days ago, I talked to some people that were actually trying to adopt 
people, you know, mm -hmm. saying, hey, like, mm -hmm. I want you to have this opportunity. And that touched my heart, you know, because hearing, hearing these people that's, that are just reaching out, that's unity. You know, that's, that's something that, that they say, I don't know who you are, but I believe in your dream. And that dream, just because it has a title that's getting removed, doesn't mean that it's not a dream. And it doesn't mean that it's not coming true. You know, it's going to happen. And I feel like, like art is one of the main things, like protest, you know, in, in a way of artistic points of views. You, you put up what you feel up there and, and people look at that, you know. So one of the, the art pieces, you know, that, that actually in the Tecate border, you know, that, yes. that, mm -hmm. that, that was in the news, you know. So people see that. People see that, that, that there's unity, that people are rising, you know. And, and to see that, that's a great movement. You know, so I feel like like there is a, a lot of fear, but there should be that unity. And with unity, you know, we we can move. We can move and we can go places. Okay. So. And David, mm -hmm. I want to ask you. Mm, we we uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, culinary experience, the Mexican cuisine, and how we're uh, improving in that area, mainly in this area. And now with uh, beer and your place, um, how can that be a, an element or a vehicle to unite? Uh, because there is a division in this country. Sure. There are people that are uh, supporting uh, the relationship with Mexico and uh, Mexicans and support the dreamers and that kind. But we have to face that uh, there are a lot of uh, people that they don't. And they don't even want to know about Mexico. And they don't uh, care about world culture or anything. But how this, um, because I think that uh, uh, food and wine uh, bring people together. <laughs> you know, it's very important when you try to build community, how you have uh, uh, this, um, una mesa, you know, this uh, table with friends and everything, and you can sit people there from different backgrounds and talk, and then this unite us. But how do you see from, from your side, uh, what can you do to build this community, or what do you think about that? No, absolutely. Uh, when we first started brewing, you know, we thought about, we were the 86th brewery in town. There's now over 180, approaching 200. In, in the county. And as I mentioned earlier, what we bring to the table is our culture. I mean, if uh, you can't dispute beer brewing is about culture as much as it is about, you know, drinking and enjoying uh, yeah. beer. It, you know, there's specific regions in Europe where certain traditions came out of, you know, saisons or ales or, or whatnot. And we said, well, look, there's plenty of people exploring IPAs and doing all kinds of things, but we're going to bring our culture to the forefront. And we saw it as a way of contributing and enriching the San Diego beer scene. And in fact, we're one of the few breweries that do that, I think, in the way that we're doing it. So I think just merely being a voice in that community, which is, by the way, one of the largest you know, craft brewing communities in the world, mm -hmm. is, I think, a beginning of that dialogue of you know, people coming and saying, you took Jamaica flowers and made a you know, Belgian Saison out of that? Wow. Never would have thought of that. <laughs> and yeah, we did. And it's delicious, <laughs> you know. And so we bring our palate, we bring our tradition, we bring our culture, we bring all those things to our beer making. And I think at the end of the day, I think what we have to realize that what makes the U.S. incredible and unique is that contribution. You know, where all of us from no matter where we came from, we didn't abandon everything about who we are. I mean, we eat pizza, we, we eat hot dogs, we love, I mean, if you just look at our culinary traditions, we're... We're so rich. Just go to a country that doesn't have immigrants, and you will suddenly realize how boring that country is, no matter how good their food is. I mean, I, when I was in Guadalajara for three or four years, you know, bringing up manufacturing operations, I just I couldn't get any great Chinese food. I couldn't get great sushi. I mean, it's gotten better, obviously. It's more cosmopolitan <laughs> now. But this was quite a way back. And you know, forget about Ethiopia. Forget about all the other rich kind of traditions we have here. And that's the beauty of it. And before we know it, those foods, those traditions begin to define us as Americans. I mean, right now, salsa is more popular than ketchup. 
tacos is right up there with pizza and hot dogs and everything else. It's as American as apple pie now. So we think that, you know, bringing that beer, but, you know, we don't just stop at the beer. If you go to our tasting room, you'll see that we've created a space to also communicate visually. So all of our artwork is made by Chicano or border artists, and it really expresses that fusion. And I just get so excited, you know, looking at that, bringing in music and performance that expresses that fusion, you know, reggae in Espanol or, you know, rock in Espanol or something, and they're all just kind of, and we also have, you know, 16 of September is coming up, so of course we're gonna do the Grito, you know, we're gonna have the mariachi and everyone's gonna sing the, you know, required 10 songs that you need to know <laughs> if you're gonna be a Mexican, right? I mean, sigo siendo el rey, I mean, anyone who doesn't know that, you gotta turn in your Mexican card. So, <laughs> so that's what we do. That's what we think we're bringing. Uh, we go to food festivals. Um, we just, you know, that's our voice. That's what we express. And I think people react to it. And let me leave with this last comment. Um, it's a really interesting thing that we've discovered. We said to ourselves, we want to interpret the contemporary uh, Mexican experience. We don't want to be a commercial, you know, uh, colonial, uh, you know, copycat of, you know, some commercial restaurants that are out there that really mm. hacienda de this and via de that and all that. Good for them. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> but we wanted to reinterpret what it means to be a contemporary Latino. Someone who's considering all the cultural influences coming at them from music, food, and everything else and saying, yeah, we, these are the things we love. It, it is possible to be a Chicano or a Mexican and love Morrissey you know, the band, the Smiths. Of course. Yeah, that goes together. If you want to be a punk rock Latino too, you can be a punk rock Latino. So all those fusions are things that kind of we want to contribute to and enable and, and acknowledge. Because I think those commercial voices become very pervasive, you know? And uh, I guess this is the last thing I'd say is, the thing I'd love about it when people come into our place is they look at it, they, and it's really interesting, they look around and they say, I feel like you designed this for me or you made this for me because you're use, you're speaking my cultural language. You're, you know, we have a beer called uh, Abuelita's uh, Chocolate Stout. So mm -hmm. we use Abuelita's Chocolate and who didn't have an experience chewing on those things as a little kid? I mean, so. <laughs> so. But how can you explain that Abuelita Chocolate, for example, one, uh, you know, an American? Because that's for Mexicans. But what yeah. we want is Americans to understand us. So uh, if I put Abuelita Chocolate, it's like, okay, Marcela, that's fantastic, but it's for you. <laughs> but that's, that was the beauty. This is, we didn't expect this. So we said, let's be a contemporary Latino experience and let's make beers that reflect our culture and our experiences. Yeah. And let's be 100% authentic and have that as our focus. And so obviously Latinos find it nostalgic, connect with it, love yeah. it. The thing we didn't expect is people who are not Latino, who didn't share that cultural history, come in and still love it. And the reason is, it's exotic. It's different. And it, they still interpret it in their language. So for example, our blood stays on, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, this is, a, you know, the head, this is like a Belgian stays on, you know, farmhouse <laughs> ale, it's got this and that. And they'll describe it in their language and their, their terminology, but they love it. I mean, we've won awards for that beer or shot the Golden Stout. Um, it stands on its own. I think flavor crosses borders, right? Of course. <laughs> no, and remember that chocolate came from uh, Mexico. Exactly. So the Belgians just put added sugar and, you know, but and milk. chocolate <laughs> is from Mexico. And, and I wouldn't say exotic. I think that uh, Mexican culture is sophisticated, you know? Uh, maybe uh, it's gonna be sound like, oh, no, you're exotic. No, it's sophisticated. And you have to, like uh, music, you know, like sati. If you want to get acquainted with Sati and understand how his music is, you have to train your ear. So that's what you have to train you to get to, get to know the Mexican <laughs> culture. You have to get sophisticated. That's how I put it. And uh, I'm going to ask you, what's the difference with this concept of bread and salt, for example, with Liberty Station? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, bread, bread and salt is did not just appear <laughs> fully realized when we bought the building. We, um, we came at Bread and Salt. That's, it's been six years of moving very slowly and experimenting. Mm -hmm. 
and meeting people and inviting them in one person at a time. So and it, it, we're very organic. We're extremely informal. Okay. Uh, we give artists a tremendous degree of freedom and groups that want to meet at Bread and Salt a tremendous leeway in, in having their events. And we try and stay open and we say yes as much as possible. Liberty Station is somewhat staged, uh, somewhat of a Disneyland. There's, there's those, there, there are those aspects of it. And I, there's a lot of good things at Liberty Station. But um, we are trying to remain as unpretentious and, 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 and open as we can. But I think that's the basic difference between the two. OK. And Jesse, I want to ask you, who's helping you with all this? Because you seem like you're a fighter and you're like a <laughs> lone ranger. But who's helping you? Who, who, who's um, supporting you to do all this work that you're doing? Yeah, so actually, um, one of the people that came with me today is uh, Laura. She's from the Jacob Center of Neighborhood Innovation. And um, they're a great supporters, actually. They're, um, they've helped me learn from their classes, their courses, graphic design which is one of the things I'm going to step into with the organization. And um, apart from that, um, a lot of different organizations like uh, Monarch School um, and um, Arts, A Reason to Survive, they've helped me a lot too. So um, just different mentors and people in my life that have, that have had just believed in my, in my dream, you know, of, of creating a change and, and believed in, in the dream of art, you know, in, in general. Uh, just great people that, that see, you know, what, what the future is and, and they see that the future is youth, you know, so. Great. Well, I don't know. Oh, zero. Zero time. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't the word. So, oh, yes, we're going to, and I have some instructions to follow, right? <laughs> that, that Paula wrote to me here. Sorry. And I, oh, yes. It's a reminder that we are on live stream. So please wait until you receive a microphone to ask your questions. Second, and for our, for our live stream audience, if you would like to participate in the Q&A session, you can tweet your question to at Aspen Latinos. OK? OK, perfecto. <laughs> Dr. Rafael, ah, yeah, we have to wait for the mic. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hello, I'm Rafael Fernandez de Castro. I'm, I'm new in the area. I'm direct the center of just Mexican stories just next door. And, uh, and uh, Jim, David, and Jesse, you're ob obviously accompli accomplishing something important here. I mean, you're innovators, you're uh, entrepreneurs. So, uh, But let me ask you something. I, I hear very little about what, is, what else you need. So let's figure out, let's imagine that I'm Santa Claus <laughs> and I'm Santa. And you will ask me two things to get what you want to, to make sure that to get your dream done. Uh, what would you ask Santa? I mean, Santa could be the federal government, the state government, whatever. But what is what else you need out there to to accomplish what you want to accomplish? Can the consulate ask these two things? To <laughs> that, that's why I didn't Sorry, ask you, Marcela. <laughs> it's not about budget. <laughs> I yeah, I would, uh, I would start by saying, dear Santa, but in place of Santa, we're um, the Friends of Friendship Park, which I'm a member. We are petitioning uh, the president of both the United States and the president of Mexico on a change.org uh, petition that we're going to open next week to um, allow us to design and construct a truly binational park on the border, the site of Friendship Park. And, um, and, the park, and the park will be the park will be very large. It will encompass all of what you see at Borderfield State Park, the Mesa, the Mesa part of it, where the parking lot is on the U.S. side, and a, the same size piece in Mexico. And it will have a pier that goes out on the border where people from both. So this is many acres of a binational park. And the, the time is, is right now. It may it may seem more impossible now. But I believe it's actually closer to being possible, because there's enough people, I, I think, like us and others out there that see this as a, a very important need and a, a, a signpost that we can show the rest of the world. So and that's what I would ask Santa's, the, the presidents. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Should I go? 
Um, kind of selfishly, but also for the community, I think because we face the same issues. Uh, number one is, boy, navigating the administration and permitting and licenses is incredibly complex. We work with the ABC, you know, the local government, uh, health department, and fire department, and just, you know, I have an MBA and I'm working with uh, my families, um, but it's so hard to just to navigate the labyrinth. It almost feels like they don't want you to open up businesses, <laughs> but they put up barriers so high that, and I, I say that for me, but think about if we're trying to really bring up entrepreneurs mm -hmm. from the barrio, from the community, uh, from San Diego, that needs to be addressed somehow, some way. Um, and then the second thing, we are an incredibly capital intensive business uh, from a brewing. We, you know, uh, $250,000 is nothing to really get a good operation going um, from a brewing equipment standpoint and all that. So access to capital is very interesting. I was listening to the panel earlier and it was really interesting that what didn't come up is this whole change last year around equity based internet offerings. Uh, where you can actually do sell stocks in your company on the internet to other people who are either accredited investors or just the public. There's different ways of doing it. And so I've just been coming up the learning curve on that, but that's something that I think has great potential. And we as a brewery want to see how we can use it to fund our growth. Okay. Uh, we have talked to private equity investors, but they come with strings as well. So <coughs> we kind of like the idea of going down this route and seeing what we can do. Okay, well, um, one of the things I really agree on licensing, that's that's very true. It does seem like like it's kind of like a little border, you know, saying you really want to try to make this change, but it feels like there's just so many things that are against it, you know. And um, another thing would be supplies to be able to spread out that information, like resources and outreach, you know, that's one of the main things. Um, I, I do believe that there are so many people here that want to help, and there's so many people out there that want to help, you know, but being able to connect people to yeah. these, to these um, resources, that's, that's something that we need to work on. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the meetings that I've been to, we always talk about, you know, how, how do we make a change? How do, you know, and, and some of them would be very nice dining, you know. But once we leave out of those doors, what are we truly doing? You know, what, what is the change? You know, how are we connecting people to these resources that we need to connect? So th just resources, you know, being able to, to have that connection. Well, you can use the Consulate of Mexico. We are facilitators and connectors, and if uh, any is there that we can help, uh, you know, count on us. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I don't know who else. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Trisha Richter with KPBS. Um, I have a question that's probably really specific to David. I, there's great things going on where you are. I mean, we used to go, Porky Land was like our go-to, like go get food for a family gathering, and there was nothing. Everything was closed and shut down. But I'm hearing from friends that kind of grew up in that area, that live around that area, there is some pushback, right, of gentrification. How, are you hearing that? Are you addressing that in that and Jim, I don't know if you really get this much, you're a little bit in a different area, but what do you think the answer is to that? Because I, for me, from an outsider, it's like, this is great, it's bringing people to the community, they're seeing what a great community this is, maybe they'll even go down to Chicano <laughs> Park. Yeah. But I'm hearing people that live in the community that maybe think it's not being handled so great, so I'm curious what's really happening on the ground. Well, I'll tell you what we're trying to do. So we've coined, not we've coined, but there's a term called gentification, mm -hmm. not gentrification. Gentry, mm -hmm. And so we, we ascribe to that philosophy. How do we improve the neighborhood while balancing the needs and most importantly, keeping the identity, which is not just the buildings and the businesses, but it's also the people that make that community so special. So Barrio Logan, many may not know, is incredibly prolific in the art scene. I mean, James, you've probably seen that as well. There are tons of galleries when I first came there. And that's what really brought me there is that there's a whole culture and community and so I think that's where we're trying to go. But the real rub with anything really is any improvements to that barrio will have impacts on the rents. And you know I don't know what the solution is. I mean, if I was a property owner, I wouldn't be very excited about rent control, but that's one solution. Um, there has to be some kind of joint private sector, public sector, community involvement to try to really make an effort to keep the spirit and the soul of the community, even as it improves. 
And, uh, and so we've been trying to walk that balance. And I'll tell you, we're not the only one. Boyle Heights is really a hot spot right now. Um, you know, up in San Francisco, it's really a phenomenon that's going on across the U.S. and a lot of communities. Um, as a business, we do the best we can. One of the things that we've really tried to focus on is really trying to make community entrepreneurs. I'm a very passionate about the entrepreneurial community and using whatever resources and knowledge we have to help those around us. And if you go down Logan, what I'm really proud of is Logan is actually, there's a lot of community entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there's a, by the way, I'm going to put in a pitch for La Bodega selected one of the best gallery experiences in San Diego, right there. Best taco shop, Salud, right there on the corner. Uh, Por Vida, hopefully will get voted one of the best coffee shops in San Diego. So it's, and they're all people from the community. And that's what I think really gives it soul. Uh, it, and that's something that's been there from the beginning. And it needs to be something that continues on as the neighborhood evolves. I'd, I'd like to add to that. And uh, as, as David was mentioning, that gentrification or even gentrification, the, the main problem, everyone wants improvements in their communities. You know, you want, a shop, you want a store where you can buy food. You want convenient shopping. You want lights on at night, safe place to walk. Yeah. But the, there are, there's, and, and I as an architect, I'm interested in strategies to keep housing costs down. And there are strategies. Hopefully it won't come to rent control, but that's, that's like the atomic bomb of strategies that we still might need, but there's a couple others that we can utilize. There's a small lot uh, incentive or a small lot uh, housing program that's already been accepted in the city of San Diego, where on a single family lot, you can divide it into up to five actual fee simple single family homes. So in effect, you're creating properties with less value, smaller properties, and the rents will never get too high. They can't by virtue of their size. Another important tool that the city is debating right now is the Granny Flat initiative that gives all uh, single family owners the right to add a rental unit on their property. And if the legislation is handled properly, they'll get rid of the parking requirement for that, which is what makes it impossible to achieve now. That will flood the market with affordable apartments and it will happen in all uh, the whole area of San Diego. That's a really, really important legislation that will also have the long-term effect of cutting down on, on homelessness. So these are two ways to fight the rising cost of housing that we really, we really must focus on. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Francisco Valle again. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, activity throughout the country for organization, you know, supporting Hispanic growth. But what is preventing the major American companies, except for like Bimbo, I mean, um, uh, Pepsi, you know, Kraft or those, to really invest, like companies from outside are doing it, like Nestle, Bimbo USA, et cetera. Why are the American companies not as aggressive in that? And I'm going to ask you, David, in your case now, the, you had the on the new CEO, you know, HP. He's an Australian with a different type of background. <laughs> Is he going to really embrace this? Because they're pretty multicultural. So what is, what is preventing these American companies? Because they're not growing as fast as the outside companies, Nestle, grew from nothing to $15 billion in only six years in the U.S. Hispanic market. Ben & Jerry's, by the way, opened Brazilian operations before they came to, America, to, to the Hispanic market in the United States, which you cannot compare the markets yeah. and purchasing power. Yeah, you know, that's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that HP has gone through its own journey. It's one of the oldest tech companies in, in the world. And uh, we've obviously restructured and to split into two different enterprise and consumer. Uh, and I think we're providing growth, but I think you're talking more about, uh, you know, we're a very global company. La I, I manage Latin America. That's my largest market for my educational products. Um, so incredibly important for us. Um, I think it just really depends on the products and the markets. Um, but, but we're very global. I'm not sure if we, uh, are attuned to the Latino community in the U.S. That's probably another angle that you're coming at it. 
Yeah, um, I would say that we have a lot of internship programs, you know, we, with, that are tied to universities and, and we work with folks. Uh, but I haven't seen any marketing per se that's very specific to that market segment. And I think it's just, it, I think it gets lost. You know, when you're in the billions and billions of whatnot of anything, it just gets lost and you have a much more generic approach to, to the market. Well, the last question. Yes. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> um, my name is Valeria and, well, I'm a border citizen. I love the border and I love to study it. I grew up in Tijuana, I'm living here in San Diego right now, and uh, I love it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that most of the people here in this room today also are consider, also consider themselves to, you know, border citizens like myself, uh, and that's pretty cool. But I think that also um, many people, both in San Diego and Tijuana, don't see what we see in the border. There is this border wall that at some point was created in their minds, and we receive questions like, hey, you crossed the border today? Why? Or here in San Diego, they tell you, you're going to Tijuana, you're going to die. And I'm like, no, you, you won't. Yeah. So in your opinions, you as border citizens too, um, what can we do, everyone here today, to like demolish these walls that have at some point uh, were constructed in these people's mind? What can we do to truly make this border culture, like widespread border culture in like this binational region? What do you think? Who wants to answer? Um, I think being able to um, share the culture, you know, spread spread the spread the culture a little more, you know, let let people know what what we really are about, you know, let let them know that it's not just about oh you go across the border you're gonna die, you know, it's not like that. Like we're so much more than just that fear, you know, we're so much more. We we have. Like I said, like well, like every everybody here, like you know, we're spreading out. The border is just something that that's physically there, but everything else. How how did it cross? How did our culture cross? How did all that, you know, the food, the art, the music, everything? You know, you hear Despacito on the radio how many times? You know, so it's being <laughs> it's being able, and it's not only like like from it's just different types of 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 people, you know, coming together and sharing that culture not necessarily only having to be Mexican, but everywhere else, you know, spreading that, that love, you know, spreading instead of just saying it's violence and fight, what are we really about? You know, let, let's spread that, that truth, you know? So I think that's the main thing that we have to focus on. If I could just add, I like how you put it, it is a third identity, right? I, I kind of, I realized very early on que ni, no soy de ni de aquí, yeah. ni de allá. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Guadalajara, they made it very, very clear to me that I wasn't Mexican. <laughs> and I've grown up in the U.S. and I've always known I wasn't quite 100% um, from a cultural perspective. But I think that's, so to me, the border citizenship or border identity is a state of mind. And I think the artwork, I think the food, and honestly, I think it's happening already. I think it, it's not at ground zero. I mean, if you look at uh, Tijuana, it's one, it's one of the largest hotspots now for craft brewing Mexico. Mm -hmm. Where they're racking up awards, they're doing all kinds of stuff, and where did they get that? What a coincidence. We're a hotspot for beer, they're a hotspot for beer. Well, guess what? It's this. This is going on. Every weekend they're coming over here, we're going over there. And now there's this interesting, it's really a level of conversations, I think. You can have a conversations about business, and I think that you know after NAFTA that began to get more formalized. It's always been there, but it started to grow. Maquiladoras, these are all different. So if you had like a conversation meter, like what are people from both sides of the border talking about? I would say that conversation's gotten more and more intense, more diverse, more interesting, and over a, more, a larger variety of topics. Now we talk craft beer across the border. Now we talk about food, Valle de Guadalupe, wines, uh, all kinds of things. So I think, I think it's happening. We can encourage it more, and I think we all do, uh, but it's happening. <laughs> Bigger. <laughs> James, you want to add something? Yeah, if I, if I, could, if, if, if sure. I could wish that uh, the citizens of the U.S. one by one visit Friendship Park on the Saturday and Sunday between 10 and 2, the only hours that it's open, and they go between the two walls and, and see the families meeting across that really tight woven fence where all you can touch are fingertips. That's it. You can barely see a person's face, but it's, it's the 
probably the aesthetically ugliest park yeah. in America, or maybe the world. But at the same time, it, it has a, a, a very deep soul, and it's a, one of the most important <coughs> parks also in, in America. People would have a different idea about uh, the, uh, what the border wall, mm -hmm. the destructive quality of our current situation with the border wall. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse, David, James, and to everybody here. And if you want to ask me what we should do, I think that we have to lead by example. And if we are going to say, I'm going to work on this, let's work on that. If I say I'm going to be honest, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be direct, let's be direct. I think that we have to have this commitment. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was an extraordinary panel, Marcela and Jim and David and Jesse. Thank you all. Um, I'm Monica Lozano. I'm with the Aspen Institute um, Latinos in Society program. And I want to thank Carlos Vela and Ambassador Kokar for um, the partnership with the Institute of the Americas. Our goal today was really to um, have this kind of a conversation, an open, honest, frank conversation, and to take beyond the Tijuana, Tijuana San Diego area exactly um, a reframing of what it is that's going on on this border region. And as, as we heard, um, we actually, you know, we heard at the very beginning, borders are universal, but we can choose to harness the energy, the creativity, and the economic potential of regions like this. And we wanted to surface this morning a conversation about innovation, about entrepreneurship, and about creativity, and how those come together in places like this to really reshape the narrative. And that was one of the themes that we heard this morning as we talked about breaking out of stereotypes, thinking about regions from the bottom up, elevating voices that don't traditionally get heard outside of areas like this. And so we were challenged, and we were challenged in, a, in, a, in frankly, a, a beautiful way. Um, we thought about US-Mexico as a place of imagination and possibility, a land of pioneers in the 21st century, that this is the new frontier. It's not a border. It's a place where minds are connected, where talent is unleashed, and we're able to unharness um, the power of what happens in places like, to, like this. We also talked about very practical issues. You know, what are the challenges that you have to overcome, whether in business or in the arts? And some of those have to do with um, mentorship, um, bringing a spotlight to expertise, you can't hear me? Um, you couldn't hear, should I start over? <laughs> I'm only joke. I'm joking. I am absolutely joking. <laughs> I am absolutely joking. I'm not going to start over. Um, we talked about mentorship and expertise, about social networks, about um, cultural identity and life experiences, about the importance of physical spaces, capital access, building ecosystems that include government, industry, and local leadership. We talked about building and creating binational villages of support. And so this was the conversation that we hope to have today. And we started with business and we ended very deliberately talking about art and culture. Because what we just heard here is that this is where culture can actually move faster than some of these other areas. Um, the potential of art to both um, protest and to elevate the realities that, that, um, in, that describe who we are as binational communities. It's redefining what it means to be Latino and to live on the border. It's the fusion that is expressed in music, art, and architecture. So the, the issues that we raised today with you, from the very practical to navigating these spaces to identifying you know, very um, specific things like access to capital, et cetera, all of that was important. But within the Aspen Institute, Latinos in Society sort of program area, it really is about changing the narrative. 
And so we did want to begin to re-describe for not just people in this room, but for people that are outside of this room that are better trying to understand that it isn't about violence and, and the deficits. In fact, it's the very opposite of that. So approaching this with sophistication, recognizing that we're not just neighbors, we're roommates, that it's not what's probable, but what's possible, that it only takes a small group of people to make a movement, that we can reshape the narrative from the bottom up, and that we are creating here a new identity. So it was precisely that conversation that we, wanna had, that we wanted to have. We thank you for being a part of it. This concept of Friendship Park, which is just so dramatic when you think about a space that is a physical space where we touch each other by fingertips, and yet we touch each other in rooms like this with the creativity of ideas, with the willingness to move forward, to understand that it takes honesty and hard work and that we must live by example. And that example is happening right here in this region every single day. So we thank you very much for being a part of it, for sharing this morning with us, to the Institute of the Americas, to the Aspen Institute Latinos and in Society program, and we very much appreciate your participation today. Thank you very much.